last year we had two virtual reality projects at Sheffield Dockfest. One was by Noni de la Peña, who's here, and uh, Oscar Rabi, who's also here, and they're both here with new projects. And a hell of a lot has happened um, in that year, so much so that we decided to dedicate um, an entire space, the site gallery down next to the showroom, to, uh, w w where you can see nine virtual reality projects, and the whole afternoon today to talk about those developments. Um, and to help us sort of uh, find our way through all of this, Noni's agreed to come along and to moderate the afternoon. So she'll kick things off um, and then introduce the speakers, as Catherine did this morning, and, and uh, kick off the Q&A. So, Noni de la Peña. Hello. So thank you for coming. I um, forgot about another speaker here, uh, Mike here. Um, I'm going to start out just kind of giving you a little bit of VR background uh, on the CG side. We'll hear a lot about 360 video. <clears throat> I work a lot in computer graphics. So I'm going to give you just my little background uh, and a shorter version of some of the brilliant speakers you have here today. And then we're going to slowly sink you in deeper and deeper into the uh, the ins and outs of making VR, and you've got uh, brilliant uh, teachers uh, and leaders and thinkers and storytellers coming up. So um, I'm gonna just gonna jump right in. This man, Anastasio Hernandez Rojas, was brought to the United States as a young boy. Um, he'd never been in trouble with the law. And then um, during the biggest downturn, he decided to steal a bottle of tequila and a steak for his wife on Mother's Day because he'd had no work. He got caught, he got deported, and he got um, caught trying to sneak back in the country. And when the officer who caught him beat him up a little bit, he complained to his supervisor. And rather than doing anything about it, the supervisor let that same officer take him to a dark pen, when then, after a while, more than a dozen officers beat and tasered him to death. Now, it was covered a little bit by the national press in, in the United States, but it never really made it under anybody's radar. So I decided I wanted to make a virtual reality piece that put people on scene and, and made them witness what really happened that night. So that video is now at 670,000 and climbing views, um, which is more than any of the national press really had you know, gotten to it. Plus it's got pages and pages of discussion about race in America. So it actually took a virtual reality piece about this very important story to call attention to a case that otherwise just sort of disappeared. Some of you may know that about, I started doing uh, virtual reality journalism, immersive journalism, about five years ago when I tried to call attention to uh, hunger in Los Angeles and really hunger in the United States and how people were waiting these long lines at food banks and food banks were running out of food. Um, and when I first started trying to make these pieces, uh, I was considered, you know, it was considered a worse than half-baked idea. I had colleagues um, literally pointing their finger at me and saying, you know, you can't do that, that doesn't work. Um, and I had no money, but I decided to make the piece anyway, and I did have this great intern, and she went to that food bank line and um, was there when a man waiting there who had diabetes didn't get food in time, his blood sugar dropped too low, and he collapsed into a diabetic coma. Um, and we just, when I heard that audio, I knew that's what I wanted to build with. Uh, we didn't have any funding, as I said, so I, I got virtual humans donated. Um, and this is before uh, we started seeing GoPros out there, so, so we weren't shooting in 360 either. Um, and um, this gives you an idea of, of what the scenario looked like that we recreated using motion capture and animation. So for, for that man there, uh, the body feels real. Even though he can see out of his peripheral vision, because he can kind of walk around, he's fully immersed. I mean, he knows he's here, but he feels like he's there too. You'll see he'll be very careful not to walk around the seizure victim. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, this was a very experimental piece at the time. And we were lucky enough to get into Sundance in 2012 as the first virtual reality project. But... Um, Again, I had no idea. I was sort of terrified. And we showed up with these sort of duct tape, can you turn the volume up? Duct tape pair of goggles, that to me. So you can hear the surprise in my voice. And by the way, those duct tape pair of goggles, uh, my intern at that moment was Palmer Lucky, uh, who built those goggles, went on to a, a Kickstarter in the fall for something called the Oculus Rift. Um, so things have changed a lot since then, right? 
Uh, but what was amazing was at Sundance, over and over and over again, I saw people down on the ground trying to comfort the seizure victim, try to talk to him, try to care for him. And it became very clear that this was a space that had a lot of power uh, for telling these kind of stories. Uh, I was then commissioned to build a piece about Syria. Um, and here's a trailer. So uh, after a run at the World Economic Forum, where it was commissioned, it went to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, and it wasn't advertised. We were there for five days in the tapestry room. Uh, and people who happened to come in to want to look at that old storytelling would be uh, confronted by our cameras. But um, these are people from around the world, all age groups, who knew nothing about what they were getting into. And at the end of the five-day run, we had 54 pages of guest book notes with comments like, um, absolutely believable, it's so real, and absolutely fascinating, a real feeling as if you're in the middle of something that you normally see on TV news. So this stuff works. Here at the festival, I have Kia, which tells the story of two sisters' valiant but unsuccessful attempt to rescue a third sister from uh, being brutally murdered by uh, the ex-boyfriend. And using their cell phones, they, both the two sisters called for help to the police, and they were live. I used the audio from their two cell phone calls to reconstruct the scene um, that couldn't be captured any other way. So you can see on the left are the models of the virtual environments, and on the right, I'm sorry, left are the real environments, right are the virtual models, and how we try to stay very, very close to the facts. Finally, I'm going to wrap up. This is a, uh, just to show you that, that currently the processing power on a mobile phone means that if we're going to use virtual characters, they have to be down res and they're not that realistic looking. But um, now in, the, in game engines and higher end computers, we can make things incredibly photo real. So this is how the models are starting to go into game engines. So you can scan people, but you can also cr uh, create people in a way that um, uh, the realism of environments, you know. And with Project Tango, you're able to scan and um, actually enter the spaces yourself. So um, now I'm going to turn this, start turning this over to introduce you to the amazing team that we have going. Uh, up first is Thomas Wallner, and I'm going to let you switch out computers to Thomas, please. So uh, Thomas is the founder of Deep, and he's an Emmy Award-winning producer. I don't know if anybody... Where are you, Thomas? There you are. I'm, I'm, I'm introducing him. Come on up while he plugs you in. There we go. <laughs> I don't know. How many here have had a chance to go down to the VR arcade yet and see some of the pieces? So some of you have been already seeing these amazing, the amazing works that you're going to see there. And I'll let Thomas talk a little bit more about this. But um, he's uh, written and directed eight award-winning feature documentaries. And um, currently, he and his team are starting to use virtual reality to really push into the way that we can do beautiful 360 um, shooting and capturing of environments and telling stories using these new technologies. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think I just need a bit of picture. Ah, there we go. Okay, well, thank you for coming. Um, I wanted to say that um, I, I think who in the crowd is, is from the documentary film world? And who is in the interactive cross-platform media world? And who is both? OK, all right. Yeah, I, I think that's, a very, that, that's an indication of how the lines are blurring. And uh, I've, I've worked all my life as, as, well, not all my life. Obviously, when I was a child, I was making films. But um, I worked in film and, uh, and interactive media both at the same time. And sometimes I would make films that had absolutely nothing to do with interactive media. Uh, the last two films I made, one was about Guantanamo, and I actually know none of you did a great virtual Guantanamo piece. Uh, another one was about um, transsexuals in Belgium who are aging, which makes me a trans producer, transmedia producer. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, but then, um, over the years, I've, I've worked a lot in interactive media, but it kind of left me a little dissatisfied in terms of the, the emotion it could generate. I, I found that the films that I was making had an easier time eliciting strong emotions from the audience versus the interactive pieces uh, that, that I was doing. And 
my, my sort of foray into VR cinema came about because of this wonderful project that was uh, proposed to my company by Arte. And they were doing, together with the Canadian company, Primitive Entertainment, a 10-part series about the Northwest Passage. And what they said was, can you do something on the interactive side that isn't about facts, but that sort of gives people a sense of the Arctic, because that's what we want to do. And at that time, I was becoming aware of, of three, the, the possibility of capturing reality in 360 degrees, and this seemed like a really enticing thing to try. I knew very little about it and sort of had to learn everything from scratch. And, and it's been a pretty wonderful journey uh, that has led me to actually now specialize in immersive films primarily uh, at the moment. So I'll, I'll give you a little glimpse of what came out of, that, um, out of that project here. Let me go. So this was actually initially uh, made for, for the web. And the, the point of that particular story was that this weatherman, now that you know, climate change is unfolding, can't actually tell the weather anymore. It's become so arbitrary that that tradition is lost. And you know, so th there was always uh, sort of a human dimension to this, this story. I'm going to just tell you very quickly how these images are created. Uh, Richard is going to tell you more about that later, but just to put everything in context. So basically, this is in, um, this is in Greenland by a large glacier where you know, we put this spherical camera at the bottom of a drone. <laughs> I have to say, we did, like, for ourselves, all these things really for the first time. So we're in the Arctic. We never put this thing on the drone. And, you know, it's, it, it, was quite, it was quite the adventure. I don't think I've actually had that many unknowns stacked on top of each other on a project. But that's how you learn, and that's how you also lose a lot of equipment. <laughs> We took, uh, I think we took about 30-something GoPro cameras <laughs> to the Arctic and came about back with about a third. They're sort of scattered there. Um, so so the, the, the principle is really always the same. You have uh, a, what is a cluster or an array of cameras looking in all kinds of directions uh, that create a sphere or, or parts of a sphere that are then assembled together into a whole. And these cameras can take on many different forms, uh, as you can see here. Uh, the latest one at the bottom left is, is um, a camera that, you know, the plans for which you will be able to download from Google called Jump. Um, and, and they really, basically what they do is, and, and again, and I think the important part to know is you can do this. You can go out and, and put systems like that together and actually experiment with this yourself. Uh, so basically each camera captures a slice of this reality and then you use a stitching program to put it all together. And once you do, you have these... Uh, dioramas like this that actually captures the world completely in 360 degrees. That's really the overview, and that's, the, that's really the principle of it. Um, what makes it different from traditional shooting, as in this example here, I'm just standing there in the middle of the boat, the camera sees everything, so you kind of have to get rid of the crew, which in this case was a little door at the front of the boat where we all snuck through and hid, and then we discovered that the Inuit keep their dead seal carcasses in there. <laughs> So I'm not a, no longer a fan of the long take. So, um, and then at, at this point, you have to remember we did this for a web-based project, and we started before um, you know the DK1, which was the first um, sort of prototype of a, of a, a VR headset you could order actually became available. And I remember uh, we got ours at Christmas, and I was very curious to see what this footage would actually look like, um, and. There was no really immediate way to do this, so you know we took a gaming engine. And actually, that wasn't so hard to do, but I do remember that moment when I first put the the headset on to actually witness the footage that I had shot uh, by this glacier and this feeling of actually standing at that glacier at that moment. And that was a really uh, it, it was a very strange moment because, and I think a lot of people have had that first exposure to VR where they realize they're actually dealing with a different medium, a medium that is very different from the kind of media that, that existed before, uh, that it, it breaks the fourth wall. And it's very hard to describe, um, you know, unless you try it. Um, the principle of how it actually works is, it's, it might be obvious, but it might be good to say. So as you move your head around, the computer live it knows where you're looking through, through a sensor in the headset, and then live renders the images in front of your eyes of where you're looking, giving you the illusion that 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 reality is actually all around you. And the effect on people is quite strong. And 
I'll give you an example, a short video now of, we just, similar to you, we just got a whole bunch of people, um, you know, we pulled them into a room, we put this headset on them, we didn't tell them what to expect, we videotaped them while they were doing it and then interviewed them immediately afterwards uh, for the reaction, and this is what it looked like. So, one of the joys of showing this kind of film is that, you know, you have a four-minute experience and you see somebody smiling for four minutes, which is very gratifying and a very honest reaction, especially when people don't know that you're, you know, they're being seen because they're in this other world. That young gentleman at the end said something very important. Intuitively, he used the word presence, which has become sort of the, the, the term for this medium of what it feels like to be in, in virtual reality, of actually uh, being in that place. And as I said before, what this medium does, it, it really, truly, for the first time ever, breaks the fourth wall, which means it alleviates the distance between the observer and the observed in a way that it really did not exist in, in, in media before. And that has some pretty powerful implications. You notice, for instance, that one person in the video turned around and, and waved and said hello. And uh, that actually happened with a lot of people. And then, of course, you have that other reaction where people look down and say, oh, where's my body? My body doesn't exist, which actually freaks some people out. And it's interesting because I know people are solving that problem of how to project the body back into that, to that space, and we also thought of it as a, sort of, as a problem to overcome or, or to deal with. But this actually has a deeper implication of what that is saying. It, it, what it's saying is the, body, uh, the, the brain actually expects the body to be there, or that reaction where somebody turns around and waves is quite involuntary. So it's something that comes, comes you know, before sort of thought kicks in. So the idea is that the brain really, even at this low resolution, actually thinks it is somewhere else, and that is a, that is a very, very, very um, fascinating thing. Um, how much time do I have? About ten, five, oh, five minutes. You know what? I'm going to just skip a whole bunch of things, <laughs> because there's something I want to talk about um, in particular relating to the story. Now, this is a new medium, and it means we need new rules. And I think it's the way we've been approaching it uh, at my company is to sort of reflect upon the storytelling process in general again, you know, to step back a little bit to see where we are. Because, you know, the technology, it's all there right now. We've got headsets, we can capture cinematic uh, VR, we can, you can, we can play it back. Uh, so the tools are there. We don't have to wait for the technology to become even better to really figure this out. And, you know, it's such a cliche, but it's true. We're sort of at that point in time where, you know, where we were when people had this new means of recording reality and basically just recorded reality to see what it's like. And we can now do this in VR as well. Uh, Felix and Paul, it's a, it's a duo out of Montreal. They create these beautiful 360 3D environments uh, where there isn't much narrative. You're in a space and you're, you're just feeling that. So that's akin to sort of the train. And then there's other people starting to create narratives. You can, I believe, see clouds uh, over Sidra, over at, uh, what's the venue called? Yeah. Yes, that is correct, yeah. So check it out. Um, now, the one thing that is problematic um, they're a whole bunch, not problematic, but challenging. And, and this old film, I think, illustrates this very nicely. Let's just have a quick look at this. So you begin to realize that this film, it was an experiment that was undertaken, was entirely shot from the POV of the audience, from the beginning to the end. Please don't be so difficult to get along with. And I need help. I, I wouldn't say the film wasn't successful. That experiment was repeated a couple of times but it never really took as a form of storytelling. And the, and the question is, why, why is that? You, you, why, why, why is that not more convincing? Now, now the thing is, one of the, the beauties of VR, or one of the beautiful things about it, is that, yes, it actually alleviates that distance to the screen. You're in it. And paradoxically, we need that distance sometimes to emotionally project onto something. You know, the way, the way that standard film works is it is a medium of projecting our own feelings. And because I've run out of time, um, I won't show this clip with Hitchcock, but he explains, you know, the classic Kuleshev experiment where the juxtaposition of shots 
creates meaning that wasn't there before. And this is something we have to reflect about when we think about storytelling in VR. Uh, for the simple reason that VR is a new form where that kind of juxtaposition can be very difficult. But we shouldn't think about that just, uh, juxtaposition of images to create meaning as something outmoded because it's something very fundamental and very fundamentally deep to, to, to storytelling, not just in film, in human language, in reading a novel. What we are doing there is we're using fragments of reality that, take, that basically chop up space and time to get to the heart of a story, of a narrative. This is very difficult to do in VR. Um, but it also speaks to the fact, for instance, we have to ask ourselves, filmic narrative, did we learn it from the films? I think it's the other way around. I think the way we, we are cognitively take in reality, where we break it into little bits, is the way we perceive reality. So what a film does, it creates an orchestrated dream of fragments that it puts together as a, into a metaphor of reality. In VR, we're creating that reality. We're hijacking the senses and putting someone there. So, so it means that in some ways we lose some of the tr you know, traditional ways of telling a story which are very, very old and sort of mapped to how we, how we, see, how we you know, break down reality in the form of a story every day, every moment of our lives. So, um, so I think that's something to be aware of when you're looking for solutions on how to tell a story in VR, and my hunch is that it might end up being sort of a blend of those two things. I just want to end with one last word. Is in, in, it's very interesting, if you look at early cinema history around the turn of the century, and Andre Bazin writes about that in a wonderful essay called The Myth of Total Cinema. The early masters of cinema, when they saw the kinetoscope and they imagined what the cinema of the future would be like, they didn't imagine a projector and a screen. They actually, right away, although they didn't have the means or the technology, they imagined the holodeck, immersive 360 movies. So in a way, we're sort of folding around to the origins of cinema with VR. We're sort of coming back to the originals, perhaps fulfilling some kind of a dream that you know, people saw what the cinema would be like from the moment it was born. So I think we're in a very special and interesting age. Thank you. So, uh, obviously, as a, as a filmmaker, you've spent a lot of time thinking about what it means to be transitioning into this new medium. Um, but here's a question for you. I know you're talking a lot about what does it mean to put people in the middle of your projects, and, and um, uh, you know, they talk about how there's quite a bit of research, also, you know, cinema theory on how just going to the movies is an embodied experience. Like, you jump when something happens in cinema. Do you think that people need to have a body in the, in the VR space, or do you think that people will become a, uh, accustomed to coming in as a witness? You know, I think it's just... Um, in, or lack yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, I, I don't think you necessarily need a body, at least in VR. <laughs> it's good to have in reality. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it's, you know, I think whenever there's a new medium, you just have to sort of get used to it and, it, and its rules and, and what it does. And leave a few cameras behind. And, and, yes, and leave a few cameras behind, yeah. So. A few casualties along the way. <laughs> so, um, but you know what? On the other hand, I think it's very important to reflect upon the fact that, uh, you know, the work that is being done in the space is at the beginning of the beginning of the beginning right now. And I'm sure there will be bodies and it'll be holographic and it's all, it's sort of all converging and, you know, from different disciplines in terms of trying to figure this out. But I, the one thing I do believe that at the end of the day, and that's why I actually love your work, is that if you can't tell a story with a medium, I don't think it's going to survive because I, I think story is really what carries a medium. And I think it's story and meaning and catharsis is what people crave, uh, not the technology. The technology really should just be invisible in the end. So questions from the audience? Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, can I just say a personal big thank you because I've been interested in this field for the last three or four years and you're the first person that's come in front of us and has actually really kind of put something on the table in terms of 
the implications in terms of storytelling. Um, so I'm, I'm very appreciative of you coming here to do that. Um, but my question is really um, related to transitions. So if we take a specific, it's something I've been thinking about a lot because it seems to me to be a key thing. Um, so if we take, for example, the clip, the, the piece you showed us, um, you, in that you made a very smooth transition from the two modes. So can you just deconstruct that a little bit for us? Sure, how that sure. Works? That transition, by the way, wouldn't work in VR no. um, for, for reasons, but we have transitions like it in VR mm -hmm. that we're experimenting with. It's very simple. I can tell you the secret of how it's done. You, you know, uh, you'll see later a 360 camera. So pretend this is the boat and you're mm -hmm. Gamaley. And so we're shooting the scene in 360. Then we get a regular DSLR. We go in front of the lens like this, very low tech. And we just manually move it into the face very wide. Uh, and then we post stabilize it. We okay. merge those things. What was harder to do, and it took many, many months, is to actually create a rendering engine that would actually uh, switch projection modes in a frame accurate manner on the fly and actually enable that kind of smooth transition. So that didn't exist. We have had to build it. It was, it was really complicated to get it to be flawless. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, it, it's beautiful. Thank yeah. you. And, and by the way, uh, what we're doing now is we're actually building software uh, to ultimately allow you to do the same thing uh, and building sort of tools to go with it, which I'm very, very excited about. So maybe next year I'll be able to announce that. Yes. Next question. Is it the business model for you to uh, do more uh, project like that to send uh, to? Uh, um, do a software that is uh, used. Well, you know what happens is it's sort of, as a filmmaker, there's something you want to express, and I'm, I'm sure Nani's been through this as well. So you look around, and if you don't see the tools that you need, you create them. And that, which is really neat, because you really get to know the medium in, in, in doing that. It also means you're spending a lot of time creating tools instead of perhaps building and chasing financing for the tools instead of creating the content. But, um, you know, I think we need those tools. And without them, it's, you know, you can't paint without a brush. So sometimes you have to build a brush first. We could probably have more time for like one more question right here. Uh, Wait, can you wait one second, please, for the microphone? Thanks. Uh, speaking of tools, what tools did you use there? And how are the tools that you're developing different to what was presented there? Yeah, sure. Uh, so what we did here, that was what you saw there was a flash based prototype. Uh, and now we've gone to the level of basically creating OpenGL shaders and programming in C plus and creating kind of a, 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 a cross-platform uh, player suite and authoring tool uh, that will allow you to do that. Um, because Flash doesn't really port to mobile. It doesn't port to you know, VR devices. And, and um, yeah, so those are the tools. <laughs> It's a, it's a big it's a big project. <laughs> All right, if everybody could please thank Thomas for coming up and showing right. this amazing work. Thank you. So before I want to announce the next speaker, I want to say that underneath your seats are these boxes. You're not allowed to touch them. And if anybody sees somebody else opening up that box before the time, tell me and I will kick them out. All right. So. Um, up next, we have uh, Phil Harper from uh, Alchemy. And um, Phil uh, started at, I, you know, was a, was a joined Atlanta Productions uh, from ITN News before he, uh, sorry, where he was acting as the editor of the digital news offering that they had on YouTube. All right, you got to leave those boxes alone, guys. <laughs> Phil Harper's up. Uh, and. Um, He's, uh, he's now uh, using uh, Alchemy within Atlantic Studios to be able to focus on VR projects. So Phil, why don't you come up and you can talk about your uh, beautiful work in the Great Barrier Reef. Great, thank you. Um, hello, first and foremost. So you may have seen that we were going to be talking about our Great Barrier Reef thing today, but we are actually not. We're talking about another project that we're working on. So. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about two projects that we're working on at the moment. Um, maybe a little bit about how we did that. Um, and primarily why we're actually interested in VR in general. Where did this interest 
come from. And I always like to start with a kind of definition of what virtual reality is, but I think everyone here is pretty well versed on uh, <clears throat> how it works and what it is that we're actually trying to achieve with virtual reality. But that would work as much for a game as it would for a film. Um, this is often a, an image that people might think of when virtual reality comes up, this, this dystopian, nightmarish future. It's an image I saw many, many years ago, and it really stuck in my mind. This is way before I'd even heard of Oculus Rift. And I just thought, what a horrible, nightmarish future. But I could imagine that might be the, the case for us, because we were so embedded to the technology that we used. Um, but in actual fact, when we show people VR, and I guess you'll see as well, the reaction is overwhelmingly positive, and I think this speaks very, very well for the medium. It's something that's so new that people tend to be amazed when they see it. I guess I never lived through the time when television was invented. I never lived through the time when colored television was invented, but I imagine it was a very strange time to finally see a moving image on a screen. And I feel we're in a very similar place to that now. Um, <clears throat> so here's a little bit of background on where alchemy came from. I joined Atlantic Productions, as uh, Nona said, from ITN. And I was tasked with a, a job that many people find themselves doing now, which is the, the digital guy. Can you update our Facebook and Twitter and whatnot? Um, <clears throat> I was a little bit skeptical of some of those, those positions. But nonetheless, I wanted to find a way to really engage in a meaningful way with digital mediums. How do you take a, a production of this magnitude, such fantastic productions that they made with, with David and whatnot, and, and, and wrestle them into the digital medium? And I just felt, and we all felt, I guess, that we would undersell and kind of underachieve if we just went for a website or a Twitter page. We just thought there was something more that we could do. And around about a year prior to joining, this thing was doing the rounds. And I was super, super interested in this, this medium, and I'd made no uh, secret of that to Anthony at the company. And with such a long track record of making really brilliant 3D productions, and all of a sudden a new way to engage with 3D film emerging, <clears throat> excuse me, maybe there was something in it. So the interest was there, and luckily, as I'll explain in a moment, we. I was able to experiment, and I think to play, and to not be worried about making mistakes, and to feel confident that you really don't know what you're doing is a good thing. And you should just jump in feet first and try and find out how, how you can and what you could do in this medium. What I, another thing I find super fascinating about this medium is how quick we've moved from this all the way through to where we are now. They've kept to hit the sort of dev community pretty quickly after dev kit one, a real big leap in terms of the technology in a very short period of time, a high resolution screen, positional tracking, which is, you know, allowed you to peer around objects and underneath them. It really didn't take very long before that was on the market. Then the Crescent Bay prototype, I don't know if anyone has tried this yet, but I tried this in LA a couple of months back, maybe December, I think, and it was incredible. Like, it was at that point that I realized that even though I felt VR was going to catch on and I'd kind of pushed quite hard for it within the company, seeing this in LA absolutely blew my mind. And then I knew this medium is going to catch on. I felt like I had had a conversation with an alien. It was a very bizarre experience in which this alien felt so real to me and I could move around the alien and it was looking at me and it was talking and I, I kind of felt like I should respond. My brain couldn't accept that it wasn't real. And so I was kind of like in the, do you want a cup of tea mode, as if an alien had really landed. And I knew it wasn't real. My conscious brain knew it wasn't real, but some part of my brain was completely tricked. And now we have the actual final kind of version, which will be hitting the shelves of Oculus, I should say. There's lots of other versions out there. That's going to hit the shelves kind of 2016, they think, or they say. So that's a very short time period. I don't exactly know how long that is. But if you look back at sort of virtuality and that whole bubble that emerged in the 90s, there's still some cynicism that virtual reality won't catch on. And I think that's fair, that people would be skeptical or unsure. Um, and they often will cite when we talk about it, it collapsed last time, why would it not collapse again? And it's, the answer is very, very simple, that the technology simply was not there. That it can, you, you could possibly achieve what's possible now for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, but was, this was never going to catch on the, in the commercial market, um, simply because this is rubbish and anything that was worthwhile was way, way, way too expensive. And the difference is now, the technology is there. It's sitting inside my pocket, and I guess pretty much everybody here has one of these devices. And 
Most of them are after sort of Galaxy S4 territory are capable of producing um, a VR experience. This timeline was accurate on the VR front about two months ago. It's now completely inaccurate. And I think that's kind of testament to just how quick all this stuff is catching on. Um, forgive me if I'm talking very fast. I often do that. Uh, this is the area that we are most interested in. And I guess this was the point at which we thought perhaps there's a future for film. And the reason, firstly, I would say, is this is a much more passive experience. Um, I've got one of the devices here. This is the new S6, which you can go and get right now. But you'll, you'll notice that there's very little input device to this. They, they do ship with control pads, but they're clunky. It's weird. People can't see their hands. That whole input mechanism hasn't been ironed out yet. But what people immediately understand if you put this on is they know how to look. They know how to look around. Their eyes, they use every day as soon as their eyes are open. That's all you need is to, is to put this on. And so we use that as a stimulus for our projects. Could we give someone a VR headset, have them put it on, and have them immediately understand what it was we were trying to do? And it was from that point with the rise of mobile and us focusing on here that I think we sort of <clears throat> found the direction we'd like to head. And if I can, I've got this, the same picture that you used of this guy. He's always doing the rounds. This is, this is the... I'm having a nice time on Oculus Rift guy. I actually have no idea who it is, but I've seen this picture time and time again. So the things that are actually driving this technology, um, I find it interesting in that there's a convergence of technology that's happening at an incredible rate right inside of this medium. But also, I think that convergence of technology is <clears throat> matched by a convergence of culture, which also happens right inside that medium. And it kind of makes no sense, but I'll, I'll try and explain. Higher resolution phone screens happening incredibly quickly. Much, much higher um, on more powerful mobile processing units. Better and better software constantly is allowing this stuff to happen um, and open access to that software to make this stuff happen. 3D printing, a lot of these prototypes were 3D printed, so the technology can iterate very, very quickly. Um, a huge demand on the gaming side for this kind of technology. They're trying to pull it through to the market, so that's pretty cool. But on the storytelling side, on the sort of culture side, Often we're asked as storytellers, you know, how can we make our films more interactive? How can we engage new audiences? How can we, you know, there's this constant buzz and, and pull to try and translate these projects to this audience that there's a general fear that, you know, we don't understand what they like. We don't understand how they're consuming their, te their media. There's this worry. And I, I feel like VR ticks a lot of those boxes. You can add interaction. You can add gamification. You can do new types of narrative. And the big one for me is you truly can immerse someone in your story. You know, we can do immersive storytelling and if you're a very talented filmmaker. You can be very, very immersed in the film. But we can kind of literally immerse you in, in, the, um, in that world now, as Thomas has explained. And I, I find that very, very exciting. Another one that's often missed is social. People think this is an extremely isolating experience. But I, you will see when this really hits the market that it isn't. Facebook bought Oculus Rift for an obscene amount of money for a reason. Um, because they know that this will be a very, very social medium, and I find that exciting as well. Yeah, all the other buzzwords. Um, so here we are in 3D, and you'll see that this, if you type 3D televisions into Google image search, you'll see dozens of images like this. This is how 3D television guys have always wanted to um, sell their products, but I think we can actually do this now <laughs> in VR. You know, we can't make a turtle come out of the screen, but we could perhaps bring you closer to it through the medium of virtual reality. So how did we get started? This was how we got started. And this is why I say that we, uh, you shouldn't be worried about making mistakes. This is the director of Natural History Museum Alive. He actually won a BAFTA just prior to helping us figure out VR. And we thought, we're miles ahead of the game here. Look at us, pioneering in the space on first person 360. But in actual fact, the idea has been around for some time. That was a picture I found on the internet that I thought was quite funny. of someone donning a very basic VR headset. But we took that camera that you see there, on, mounted on the top of Dan's head, and there was a shoot taking place in Borneo, um, and we simply gave that camera to one of the producers. And whilst David was doing a piece of the camera, we managed to get that camera in front of him very, very briefly. Anthony had done that, and David delivered a piece to camera. That footage made its way back to me, and we stitched it together. I'll, I'll move on quickly from this, because Tom's did a great job explaining how this works. We took the six camera feeds from that rig, and we stitch them together and we get the full 360. But what we found from viewing this back on a headset 
was the engagement that you can have with a person as they speak directly to you in VR was kind of like unnerving, actually. It's kind of strange. You feel, the sense of presence is like, wow, you know, David's stood in front of me. How nuts. Um, and we thought it was at this point that we thought that there was something in it. And then there was a big leak about this, and there was some kind of wrong story leaked online that we were making an entire film this way. And the excitement was just huge. People seemed very excited by that possibility and started to kind of demand that we do something about it. Um, Tom's touched on this, so these are the different kinds of cameras that you can use to do it. But I'll, I'll jump on and explain some of the projects that we're working on. Um, we've always thought that underwater would be a sweet spot for this, simply because of the, you know, you feel normal sticking one of these on. It kind of feels like a mask is on your face, a, a snorkel mask and whatnot. It's, a, we just think in general VR and 360 underwater works very, very nicely. So we had the opportunity to go out to Bikini Atoll um, and take some of these underwater cameras with us. And that's a huge collection of sunken shipwrecks. And I think this speaks to the medium quite well. It's, it's a very strange feeling for divers to be going into shipwrecks. They always say it's very claustrophobic and they've never managed to translate that through this media, uh, through you know, TV before. And we thought maybe we could do that in VR. What would it feel like if you put on a headset and you really were inside of a shipwreck as you moved through? And what would that appear? Uh, and these are some of the rectilinear images that we've got back. This is Steve Hudson, who actually got inside the USS Saratoga with a, an underwater camera. And uh, he kind of takes you on that journey. And if you, when you look at that footage back, you've always got this guy with you, behind you, sort of pushing you through as you move. It's, it's kind of strange. But quite a, quite a cool experience. This is another image of the Saratoga. And this is one of my favorite images. We actually managed to get um, a VR camera to mount on the outside of one of the submarines as it descended down into that huge space you can see at the bottom is where they used to lift planes up onto the deck of the Saratoga before they would take off. And the subpilot kind of managed to land his submarine in there. To, to go through that as an experience and feel the size of this kind of huge ship as you descend down is, is not something that's easy to translate into normal film. I think you can imagine how big that ship is. You could possibly use a comparison and make people try and think, oh, it's about as big as a bus. I know how big a bus is. But in this medium, you can make people feel that. You can place them next to it, and they're like, whoa, it's this big. This is kind of strange. Um, this one, the subpilot actually managed to put the camera inside the cockpit of a plane that had sunken. So you can kind of view back with this submarine over to your left and feel like you're in the cockpit of a sunken plane. It's a very cool experience. And then if we add to that some form of narrative, um, we think we can, we're working on making something that has a beginning, a middle, and an end, like a traditional film really is rooted in experience. So it's kind of like making a radio documentary, we think, with this additional layer of immersive things to look at because we've often found people miss what's being said because they're so immersed in looking around, like, whoa, this is cool, and they're trying to tell their friends as they watch that the audio is often completely missed. These are the cameras that we used. Um, that's us. We took two with us. They're an absolute pain to work with. They flood very, very easily. Um, keeping them steady is not easy. Uh, if you have a problem, you have to slow down everything because you've got to take it apart, put it back together. It really is a pain to work with these cameras. Um, we're hopeful that something better comes along in the not too distant future. Okay. And so this is um, another thing, that a surprise, I suppose, from the project, was that we were able to place the 360 camera on the beach of Bikini Atoll. Bikini Atoll is where they detonated um, and tested nuclear devices after World War II. They detonated many, many bombs there over a, a, a couple of years and really destroyed the island in many ways. Um, and we see these kind of images all of the time. We've seen an, a, a nuclear detonation on, on archive, but we thought, what if we could put the camera in a place that was very near to where the nuclear bomb went off? and then comp in that explosion so that you could feel or possibly be reminded or, or shown what it would be like to stand next to a nuclear bomb as it detonates. 
And this was a simple test that we did once we got back. We just thought, I wonder what that, what that would look like. And we were really surprised by how, how powerful that was. And we haven't made any illusion that we're comping in archive. We're not trying to make it look real. We want people to know that this is archive material. But it turns out to be um, a really effective method. And we think that combining archive, things that happened 40, 50, 60 years ago, into real 360 modern places is a very cool method. Um, and one possibly that we'll see a bit more of. So with this pr production, we're still working on it. We're still trying to work out how to do it. We had that opportunity to get the cameras there. We're trying to figure out exactly how we tell that story. Um, but we're hopeful that we'll have that finished by the en end of the year. Um, and from one 360 project to another, I'll very quickly tell you about this production. This is another 360 project we've been working on for some time. It started out as a complete experiment. Again, as I say, we, we've jumped in feet first to try and figure this stuff out because we're interested in the medium and think it has legs. Um, so what started out as a research and development project has now become kind of a finished thing that the Natural History Museum are going to be playing over the next two months in the Attenborough studio, where we'll have 60 or 90 headsets possibly, where you can go in, sit down, put the headset on, and you'll have a 10 minute experience where you're taken 500 million years into the past under the oceans to see some creatures that we've recreated from real fossil data um, come to life around you. And taking you on that journey is David Amber, who's done an original narration for it. Because when we showed him the renders and we showed him what we'd been working on, he was so um, interested by the project that he agreed he'd do an original narration for us, which really made it into a thing rather than just some, an experiment that we were doing. So we're re really excited to see how audiences might respond to this um, because we have no idea. Really, not many people have seen it just for the moment. So if you want to get tickets, it's available soon in the Natural History Museum. But it's a completely different project. And I think the one thing we tried to crack with this one was let's make sure we tell a story here. Let's take people from one place to the next. Let's use David to guide you through that story. Um, but if we did that in, in complete 3D, where you're surrounded by the image, where the fossils are kind of swimming past you, what would it look like? And luckily, we had a huge amount of assets already from a previous production where we brought real fossils back to life, as it were, um, in CGI. This is the method. They sort of trace around the creatures and then try and figure out together with the, the scientists at the museum um, at the Natural History Museum, I should say, what those creatures would look like. And once they've got them, you know, we've got our characters, we have our set. And the previous production that did this, um, everything's framed like this. So the artist is making those scenes and those sets for a 16 by 9 you know, shot. And everything else, kind of like in uh, theatre, is a mess. You know, there's bits everywhere. There's things that don't make any sense. There's props that aren't correct. So when we re-engaged with all the assets that had been made, and the artists realised, no, you're going to have to clean up everything because the audience is going to be able to see everything. Uh, it was a very interesting time of them cleaning up and tidying virtual sets. But this is the end result. These are two rectilinear images, a left eye and a right eye. So in each image, the entire scene is captured. We project each image around each eye. So each eye has its own kind of sphere. And that creates a 3D effect. So the final experience is totally rendered. The phones that we're, we're showing uh, the experience on only have to decode the video in order to play this back. So we're not relying on real-time rendering engines at all. We made that decision. Um, we originally did rely on real-time rendering, but we decided not to do that for this project uh, just because we wanted to keep the level of detail that was possible in the film in the VR experience. Possibly the right decision, possibly the wrong decision, we will see. Uh, the main downside to this method is the file sizes are insane. Uh, deliv delivering these to, to an audience commercially is, needs to be figured out, and possibly the H.265 codec, if any of you people are interested, might be the way to do that. But even so, you're looking at delivering four or five gigabytes of data for a 10-minute experience. Um, that's one eye stretched out, makes a bit more sense. And it's, yeah, I think I've covered up everything. These are just some of the, the pictures from the project. I've got some bonus slides if we have more time later for like, what the future might look like. But yeah, that's what we're, we're working on. <laughs> So 
So I think, I think I would like to touch a little bit more on this very end thing, a question about that, which is that, so what people are trying to do as a way to um, deal with the real-time processing engine mm -hmm. is to make these 360 videos so you can sit down and still see it in this incredible depth, but not necessarily have to have the processing power that's required to run a gaming engine on the mobile phone. Mm. And so I guess that was a decision you guys... Yeah, we originally started the project in Unity and we were developing it for DevKit 2. Oh, yeah, and we were quite happy with how that was going. We, real time gives you a huge amount of leverage, really, in what you're able to achieve. You can have real time. Explain to people what real time is versus real time capture. And real, yeah, it's yeah. so real time rendering is what you would expect to see in a computer game. The images that you're looking at are being generated on the fly, depending on your interaction with that project. So as you turn your head to the left, those images are being drawn in real time. In actual fact, they're being drawn, ideally, at a minimum of 60 times per second for each eye. So that's 120 images per second being generated to create a good VR effect. And to think that a mobile phone is capable of doing that at all is kind of interesting, but it isn't quite capable, uh, well, nowhere near capable, I should say, of drawing images that we wanted at 120 frames per second. But rendered video can do that. So you can master your video at 60 frames per second. The phone is reasonably happy to decode at that level. Um, you could prob probably push it to more than 60. Perhaps there's lots of experimenting that needs to get done to figure out what that optimum level is. But we're, we can get um, 60 on these devices. Do you think you might ever release that piece with onto a game engine. The reason I ask that is because if you love the Crescent Bay where you can walk around and yeah. move into the space. The, the new headsets, the Crescent Bay and the Valve HTC Vive, yeah. let you walk around, right? Mm. Instead of sitting down. These mobile phones do not. No, they don't. And so, have you thought about releasing that? Uh, I think the project will work fine on, on those devices. The only interaction you get is where you can look and you, there is some level of 3D audio. But I think for, for my first VR experience, it's quite a nice decompression chamber for people that all they have to do is look. For the next project that we do, if we get to do one, if indeed any of this turns out to be a success, is I would like very much for it to be real-time rendered because I think it gives you so much room um, to do other things that it would be crazy not to do it. The only downside to real-time rendering, as far as I can see, is that you're restricting your market somewhat if you were ever to try and make the project commercially viable. You're targeting people with very, very high-end gaming rigs. Um, and do those people want to see natural history or documentary content? I suppose that's a question that's up for debate. I, I, wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be surprised if that demand is there, but there's no real question as to how you do that for the moment. Whereas mobile, I think because... Everybody has one, this is a high-end device, this is a high-end headset, but you could achieve a pretty cool experience you know, with a $15 piece of cardboard and some lenses. Um, so I think that casual viewing experience is kind of cool and interesting space to be in. Okay, uh, we have the microphone for the audience. We have a question here, please. Hi, yeah. Hi, Hi I Phil. Um, I'm really interested by people's thoughts about the emerging medium and how you tell stories in the medium. And you said a couple of things that were really interesting and s felt a bit contradictory. And I just mm. wonder if you could say a little bit more on the subject of audio. So mm. you mentioned the idea that mm. a way you were thinking of storytelling was about audio story mm. with images. But then at the same time, you said, and I've really experienced this, that sometimes people are so immersed in the images that they forget to listen to the yes. story. So could you just tease that out a little bit more? Yeah. Um, the main area we found this is in, well, we found it with the first life a lot. David's script, you know, David is the star of, of the show, of the whole thing. But even when we watch it back, you're so immersed in the imagery that often you get to the end of a scene and think, what did David even just say? You know, that, that is a problem that, um, where I think we've squeezed together two art forms here. One is the documentary where everybody's kind of super engaged with the piece and it, and it works. And the other is this idea that you can look anywhere in the scene. If you just have people just in get looking and, and not much else, it does lose its novelty value pretty quickly. I mean, VR right now is being described as a cool trick in many circles. That you can give someone an experience where you could go to Tokyo, put the headset on, wow, I'm in Tokyo. But 
the window of people being interested in those things, I think, is pretty short. And they'll, they'll begin to expect very, very high production value and narrative pushes. And we all just have to figure out what that looks like. Um, and it, it, it's become a sort of VR cliche to say it, but there is no rule book on this whatsoever. The grammar hasn't been written. And I guess everybody in this room and outside will be the people who figure that out. And when we show this to people, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll hear, you know, you know, I didn't listen to this part of the narration, I didn't listen to that part. With the Bikini at All project, it's much more rooted in looking. It's, it's very thin on narration. Um, we're expecting people to just be like, whoa, this is kind of cool. Uh, and I think it will be much thinner. Um, but again, all of that we, is to be figured out. And are you doing some user testing at Alchemy with uh, audiences? Um, yes, we are. Probably not enough. Uh, so if, if anyone would like to see it, we can show them for sure. But we, the user testing is now kind of very, very, we're very close to the day where the, the, the great British public will be seeing this. Um, but yeah, we'll figure out a way of doing some more user testing. Hi, I have a question. Hello. Um, yeah, I love it. I love the stereoscopic. Um, I think that really works. Mm. What about the audio? Because this is something that really takes me out of a VR experience, yeah. is that the audio is not coming from where it's supposed to. The, yeah, 3D audio is, works exceptionally well in... Um, it's, it's in you have to have a real-time rendering engine to be playing back 3D audio. You can fake it to a point. You can create 3D audio just with headphones. And exceptionally good 3D audio. The best you can possibly get is binaural recordings, and they sound perfect. Um, but you, you have to begin to compensate and fake that depending on the direction in which the viewer is looking. So if the viewer is looking straight ahead, the 3D audio works absolutely perfectly if it's native, but the moment they look this way, it's completely gone. So the only way to then do 3D audio is to fake it inside of a game engine, and right. then you're back into the, the problem of being in a real-time rendered world. I think it's a problem that Oculus are very, very focused on at the moment. They've released an SDK within the last month that allows you to do 3D audio in film in some capacity, but I don't quite know how it works right now. Again, I'm happy to make mistakes and jump in feet first and figure that out, but at the moment, we don't know. But so it's, it's important anyway. It's very important to get it right. Got one um, more question, and then we'll have to... to she's got the mic back there. Um, is it on? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm having a bit of a moment, so maybe you can just amuse me. <laughs> I, I'm finding it really interesting to be having this conversation in a chapel. Yes. Um, <laughs> because in a way, like, maybe the chapel and the church was the first VR experience yeah. in the sense that it's like, it's this 3D space where you have this immersive heightened experience. There's like a speaker, but you can kind of explore this space. I, 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 just because we're, we're talking about content now, like the, the, just the responsibility of content. Um, Nani, you're talking about how people are like kneeling down and crying, you know? How, what are thoughts to have in terms of what stories we infuse into this medium? Um, kind of with that kind of the sense that it is this heightened emotional kind of almost faith infused perhaps. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think that churches probably were attempting to overwhelm people with imagery and colourful imagery so that when you come to that place it's like, you know, it creates an, a thrill, wow moment. And I, I th Chris Milk recently said, and I think there's some people who work with Chris Milk here somewhere, but Chris Milk had recently oh, said that next. he wants to... coming up next. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that he wanted to create an empathy machine. And I, I really resonated with that message because I think the one-on-one -on -one interaction between two people in VR is very, very powerful. And I think it was actually one of your guys, perhaps, I don't know, from on site, who I first saw look directly into a camera in VR. And we placed this camera in the rainforest in Borneo, and it was the first 360 video I'd ever rendered. And it was of a guy walking past the camera, and he just kind of walked straight past it. And he'd never seen, you know, he'd never seen one before. I think Richard will show you one, what they look like later. And you could see immediately this double take. He kind of stopped as if to think, "What the hell was that?" And then he turned back around. And of course, I'm I'm the camera. I'm watching from the camera's perspective. This guy, he has no idea what's going on. You, you know, he comes back to the camera, and he's he's staring straight at it. And I can see in his brain, he's thinking, "What on earth is that?" And he pulls out a pack of cigarettes and pulled the cigarette out and put it in his mouth and, and lit it and would still stare at the camera. And he still had no idea it was a camera. But it, that camera was me. And I was looking back at this guy and I was like, 
it was the strangest moment. It was, it was like I'd turned into a, some alien or something. And another human being was looking at me in a way that I had never experienced before. And it was so <laughs> moving and nerving. I was like, this is weird. This is super weird. There's a guy smoking a cigarette, and I feel completely weirded out by that. And the, the, you know, the power of the medium, I think, is intense. You know? So pieces to camera, things like Peep Show, and that kind of direct to the audience that Thomas was, was talking about earlier that was tried way, way back, perhaps that can take on a real powerful meaning now because the text there to really induce that freaky feeling. Okay, so that was fantastically interesting. Thank you Thank so you. much. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So fantastic. And we've got our, a, a really amazing audience here too. Good questions, you guys. So uh, up next, next is Gabo Aurora. And Gabo is a United Nations senior advisor and filmmaker. And he's worked a lot on advocacy projects and global sustainable projects. And um, he's currently focusing on using media technologies to promote social causes and disrupt non-inclusive decision-making processes. He's going to come up here and talk a little bit about using VR to try to uh, get people to um, think about their decisions a little bit differently and show them and take them to spaces that can inform them and make them better educated uh, global citizenry. So, Gabo, please. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, well, <clears throat> thank you for having me, and thank you, Noni, for moderating this and for all your inspiration um, for a lot of your work that's really helped um, a lot of upstarts like myself now uh, working in this. So thank you for all of that. So the title of this very short talk is Can Virtual Reality Change the World? And I wanted to start out with um, a little tech. It's, it's ironic. I'm very tech non-savvy. And so I just wanted to play a quick video before... Uh, Wow, okay, thank you. Um, so I, I still tear up even thinking about it, uh, even though it's, uh, we go through it so many times. But these are just some of the, the shots uh, from the film that you can see that's playing here at the uh, site gallery. And uh, just a different location. I can go a little bit more into the making of and how this happened. Um, but just a little bit, just to take you a little bit um, from a personal angle of how I got involved in this, because I'm not necessarily um, a VR. Well, now I am working in immersive and VR filmmaking, but traditionally I'm not. I'm a trained development economist and a senior advisor at the UN. <clears throat> Generally a boring guy, right? writing reports and trying to get powerful, important people to really care about people and issues that they might not want to think about. So we're always trying to influence and cajole and to come up with ways. And generally, that's been reports that nobody always reads or people pretend to read. Um, and we try to get some media coverage or we try to get some influence out of it. Uh, we also try to use celebrities. You know. George Clooney, you know, we try to use big media like the New York Times. So, a little bit of a background before Clouds Over Sidra is that I really felt, uh, you know, we're living in the 21st century and we have to change the way we communicate our ideas. We can't just be doing the same old way that we've been working. And that's why, you know, we wanted to come up with new ways. So the first thing that we did, and I don't have um, the same, some background on it, but we did a viral video series for the Climate Change Summit. Uh, it was called Keep the Oil in the Ground, and it was trying to partner with people who work in viral video technology to try to come up with something that would resonate with the public and be attached to an action and try to change some policy. And this time it was about oil extraction in the Amazon. Uh, especially in Ecuador. Uh, the video had two million views and was kind of like the first time we really realized that there is something going on here and we can really try to, to harness this. Generally, the UN is not known to be the most avant-garde uh, and we are a little bit slow. So slowly, you know, we're trying to catch up with some of those things. So the Amazon video was one. 
We also partnered with uh, Humans of New York uh, and did a world tour on behalf of the Millennium Development Goals. And for those of you who don't know Humans of New York, it's Brandon Stanton's photo blog from the streets of New York, where he has an unprecedented level of engagement on Facebook. is considered to probably be the most, uh, have the highest level of followers and engagement on Facebook. And he did a tour throughout the Congo, Iraq, capturing people's story, and we co-created a lot of wonderful content that ended up garnering about two million uh, new followers for a lot of our, our causes, and that was really important. So it was within that backdrop that I was constantly looking for new ways to be creative and to do that, and virtual reality kind of just happened. Uh, I, I work with um, the one campaign um, where we work with a lot of, their, they're a big partner of ours at the UN. And I was at an event where I met Chris Milk, who is the co-collaborator, and I'm the director, but he's the co-creator of Clouds Over Cedra, and we're now working on a series of these films, uh, where we just connected and we really felt this could be something that if we were able to bring to decision makers could help change the way they think about these issues. Um, like a lot of people, I think if you haven't experienced virtual reality, it's kind of vague, it's kind of a little bit difficult to understand what it is, and when I experienced it with Chris, uh, I knew we were on to something really, really special and powerful. Um, so every year I also advise the Secretary General on his private sector engagement at the World Economic Forum in Davos. For those of you who don't know Davos, like masters of the universe, you know, really rich and powerful people who don't necessarily understand what it's like to be in the shoes of a 12-year-old girl living in a refugee camp. And so we really felt if we did something to bring this into light that it would make a difference. And we also picked Syria because it is quite arguably the greatest humanitarian crisis of our generation with over 4 million or close to 4 million refugees, about half of them who are children. So we just did it, and it was an experiment, and it was really crazy putting 120 headsets on people like George Soros' head or, you know, really rich and important people who have to wear these things. And it was something that did really well, um, but I didn't anticipate the same level of empathetic reaction that it did have. Um, it went on to be then used in other, with other decision makers um, who are being, you know, we used it in Kuwait for the appeal for the Syrian refugee crisis, which raised uh, about $3.4 billion. Uh, it's being used in other high-level meetings. Um, but that's not enough because we really want to show a lot of impact on this. It's very hard for us to justify making this an investment in our organization if we can't show that it's leading to more of an impact. So we're recently now, um, it's just very recent, we are market testing Clouds Over Cedra um, on the street. Uh, it's going to be um, in Spanish markets, Portuguese, French, and in English as well, where UNICEF uses this in general, they have face-to-face -face fundraisers to, for a lot of their, which is a big revenue stream for the organization. They're going to start integrating VR into um, a lot of this face-to-face, -face, and that's gonna allow us to do control studies to see if it actually is making a difference in how people are donating, how people are reacting to our issues, uh, which is pretty exciting uh, to get that kind of data set and to make it, you know, a bit more democratic and bring VR into the street and, and get this story out there um, as well. We're also um, partnering with uh, media outlets uh, and we're very open to other, other um, sort of creative ways to you know, bring this out to people. And I think Google Cardboard is a good sort of uh, democratic, low-cost way to do that. We have a partnership with Foreign Policy Magazine, which has agreed to blast out, you know, uh, when our next film comes out, you know, to their 1.2 million subscribers, how to download the film and to mail out Google Cardboard to those who are interested to watch it. So that's another creative way that we can, 
you know, it's always the, the, the distribution and impact thing with this, right? Because when, when I decided to do this, the criticism was, oh, this is, an, this is a niche, elitist, uh, you know, you have to have headsets, like, you know, what is this going to really do? Because our UN values are one of trying to have impact and trying to make it, you know, uh, to reach out to people. And so I really thought that this is the way that this would do it. But I also think VR's weaknesses, uh, or if you want to call them weaknesses, can be its strength because I knew that if at some point this will go mainstream, uh, and we always play catch up, you know, we always try to, you know, are always trying to, um, you know, something great will come out and then we'll catch up. To, like with the viral videos, we did that so, so late in the game. I think it's important to be early adopters. And also, I, there's something very compelling to me that as, this, as people are starting to buy VR headsets, Cedra's story will be there waiting for them. Uh, that as a 15-year-old, they'll buy this cool thing at Christmas. And of course, maybe they want to buy it for games or for other purposes. But then also, there's something socially related that can make them realize that technology um, can be used for good and technology can connect us. And it's kind of a cliche with that, but I do think um, being very early on can really imprint and change a lot of um, young people. Um, what is, just a little bit about the future. We are doing a series of these. So this is the first of probably six uh, that we are doing. We have about three more projects in post-production. Our, our next one is on an Ebola survivor from Liberia. Uh, we have something with the Ganges River and sanitation issues in India. Uh, and then we have future ones about Nepal, uh, the Amazon rainforest, but this time the VR version, uh, and something in China that we are in, in pre-production with. So uh, this is something we want to continue to use and to also use the same distribution model in the same way to really have the impact story within it. Um, just as a final wrap-up, I actually think I did okay with time, a couple of minutes, uh, is, um, and I, I think this is reiterated by other people, um, and, you know, what's happening is the UN is getting very excited about this, right, you know, because it's doing it, and I keep trying to tell them, I was like, look, it's the story that's really good, too. There was a lot that went into it with production, and I think it is so, for a lot of people who are not necessarily within that sphere, they think it's the technology a lot of times. So I am trying to work hard to defend those same things, that there is a way to film this, there is a way to tell stories. I mean, just, you know, when I, I, I was on the ground filming um, all, all the series, I, I film on the ground with another person who, another camera person to do these. Um, you know, just as an example, I, well, the first time I went, I said, okay, I'll bring, you know, we'll, we'll bring the VR camera, and we'll bring a regular camera, and I'll do a viral video, <laughs> and I'll do this at the same time. And the frame of mind that you have to be in is just impossible. It was impossible to do both. Like, I just, because the shots and the things that you're looking at, like, you just, there was impossible, you know. Uh, and I think that's just a way to show that you do have to have a completely different mindset. You cannot multitask with it. Uh, we also tried to work on the, um, uh, you know, because I had this whole training with Chris and everything that you can't use jump cuts, you can't use close-ups, you can't use all of these things right now. And there's a purity to the filmmaking, which means that the story has to be, I think, even stronger because there's less places to hide and less tricks to use to hide it. And, you know, the other thing that we tried to do, if you see the film, um, you know, I'll show you, there's, if it goes back to, um, there's a wrestling scene here, yeah. So, I, we, sorry, uh, we want to, to, I wanted to operate on the, the principle of FOMO. Is anybody a millennial here, FOMO? Fear of missing out, right? Which is like, something is happening in front of you, but something is happening behind you. It's like a three ring circus, right? If you try to pay attention to one, you don't know. And I think, you know, that was something that I felt would work really well, that you would not know, you would feel like you're missing out something, but at the same time, you'd feel so immersed in the thing that you'd want to move in a different direction. So in the wrestling scene, 
we make the front um, camera face the children looking at the action. So you have to look back on, on those things. And, and if you don't understand, you just see these children and you don't know what they're looking at. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just as an example, that it is the storytelling, it is using the medium to do that, um, to keep it that way. So stories still matter uh, is, the, is the main sort of thing that I think is coming out from these types of things. But thank you. Thank you for having me. So I think the, the great news for all of us doing VR and interested in VR is that the prediction is there'll be 25 million VR headsets in the market by 2018. So the issue of distribution starts to become less of one of criticism, right? And then it becomes more like, well, then how do you use the issue of doing spatial narratives, right? And how do you make those pieces with these kind of, you know, um, uh, uh, constraints, but also very exciting uh, immersive elements? So um, uh, when you did that wrestling scene, I mean, I like that idea of like, you know, because that's kind of real life, right? Yeah. Where you kind of know that there's something happening here or maybe something's happening over there. Um, did you plan that ahead of time? Was that something you thought about when you went in or was it like? Well, I mean, I tried to, before going out, think that, I mean, the, the bakery scene as well, you know, I wanted to have it like in the middle where you have the fire, you have this 12-year-old kid kneading dough, you have, you know, the, the bread going. So it was something that I felt would be an innovative technique to kind of get people excited to like look in different directions because it has to be, the way this was done was in 15 to 20 second sort of vignettes and you know, I just felt that if you're just there, you would need something to draw your attention. And yeah, try, try to make sure you see all these pieces in the VR space, the site gallery, it, it's really worth it. It's worth the time. Claude Cedar, you'll hear a lot of tears coming out of that and also some very beautiful cinematic techniques. But let's open up to questions. Up in the back there. Thank you. Uh, this is all fascinating. One thing I keep thinking about in a lot of these VR presentations is the image of people in a crowded theater running for cover when a train comes at them. And there's this... I have this difficulty separating... Uh, the improvements this makes, or the way this changes the experience of telling a story from the way this is introducing a novel way of telling a story. Um, and you talked a bit about the importance of like respecting the story itself, which is like the humanly powerful thing here, I guess. Um, and I think it's pretty clear that VR and AR are things that are going to become part of our lives in the next 5, 10, or 20 years. Um, and with that, they're going to lose this sense of novelty. And so... I'm wondering if you feel that this type of experience will continue to be intrinsically captivating when we're used to this type of experience, when we're like inundated by this experience, when we're marketed to in these worlds that we spend time in, when like we consume movies and other media in this space, uh, or if that sense of the empathy machine, which I think is like, I like that idea, like that captures a lot, um, but I wonder if that might be something that depends on the novelty. Yeah, and I think that's a very, a very good question because we are wowed by the technology. Um, but my sense is um, that with every new medium, if there's some magic in the story or there's something captivating about the narrative, um, I think it will last. Um, and not just with this one, I think with all of them, I think that's what it will always be because if you go back and you look at very old films that are silent, you know, that, you know, things evolve, but they, they still captivate you because there's some magic there. So I do think there will be, there, there, it is a valid concern, but I do think it'll just be a new way of experiencing and storytelling, and I think that's universal. Thank you. Oh, Temple, one more question. Uh, back there. I wanted to know how, uh, congratulations, I think it's a wonderful piece. I saw it in the exhibition. Um, how hard was it to convince your, um, your seniors, your bosses, the people with the money, um, to make you, let you um, experiment with this project? And I, yeah. here I should say I work for Save the Children. You know, we work together oh, in terrific. Vattery in the camp. And, terrific, yes. Um, so, you know, the, we can go through a 
I can give you an uncensored account um, after. <laughs> um, it was, um, it's never easy to do anything innovative in a, in a large bureaucracy uh, that's run by old people. Um, so uh, it, it's very, very difficult to get people to do it. So there was a lot of subterfuge, a lot of subversion, where they don't, I don't think they truly understood what I was mm -hmm. doing. The insider. Yeah. When, when I was making projects here the year before, I was asking the UN for material, and they were like, what are you doing? So yeah. I, I, yeah. you had so, to have an insider. So I think it had to, it was a very, uh, like stars aligned in some ways that I could do it. And I, 48 hours before, I almost got like death threats from people. I mean, I'm exaggerating. It's the UN; they're nonviolent. But it was the <laughs> the equivalent of that. And um, I just said, "Come on, just relax. Like, is it going to be awesome?" And I knew that if it didn't go well, it would just be the end of whatever. I would I would figure out something else to do with my life. But it, it, it is it is very difficult. It is impossible sometimes to do it. But you have to take that chance. Um, I've tried to get other organizations that I won't mention that I want to collaborate with. And they have a very hard time like figuring it out. But that's why I think this narrative, the impact model, distribution, the, the trying to tell people's voices, I think hopefully it makes a, it starts changing that. And I know that Amnesty International also is using VR to fundraise as well. And I, I'm pretty hopeful that hopefully this project ends up making this a bit more mainstream. And I think that's great for the VR community and everything. And by the way, I just want to say the VR community, I mean, it's just been, it's one of those other things where once you take one step forward, everybody comes forward, Noni, Sashka at, uh, at Story Studio and Oculus, to share, to collaborate. And it really feels like, you know how in the 20s you had like Ernest Hemingway and like those writers and then the new wave. Like it's a really like a, a salon of like, very, you know, people sharing and opening up. So I think if you do take one step forward, there are other allies that can come to support and, you. And, and I just have to add one thing on that, which is if every guy VR filmmaker will invite three women, maybe one will join us. So <laughs> there are more women involved in this. I would love to see that too. Make it a more conclusive space. Um, sorry, I had to throw a little bit of that. It gets a little lonely sometimes. So um, thank you so much, Gabo. Thank and uh, you. Um, thank you. Fantastic projects. Okay, so up next we have Richard Knuckles, uh, and Richard has been doing uh, 360 in VR for uh, over four years now, and um, he's uh, working with a lot of broadcasters and agencies um, across a you know wide range range of devices. Um, and Richard, why don't you come on up, and show us what you got? Too many, too many bits. Too yeah, many. you got some bits. So. Yeah. But Richard's gonna actually going to give us some really, get us down, drill down a little bit more on some of the tech so that when you leave uh, after his talk, you will really be a little bit more armed and educated on how you could uh, go home and, and actually, it's not one of those ones, we're doing it the other way, you know. Go on, kids, go try this at home. All right. So, um, can I, th thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, I'm going to put, this is the 360 camera. Um, which actually most productions do use the the um, the GoPro rigs. This is um, a Freedom Freedom 360 rig, which is just there. And the process actually before I start my talk, um, let's actually record this. So we're going to start. I've got my the magic zoom or filmmaker's friend. Uh, that's now rolling, and I've got the remote control here, which is now connected to all six cameras. And we're now going to hit record. Um, I'm sure Philip will thank me for doing this. You've got to go and check it because sometimes the little bastards do not record. Okay, so, and then we give it a clap. That's for the post-production. So now we can sync. So if, for whatever reason, those cameras, when I hit the re record on the remote, if they're out by a couple of frames, then that clap will help us in post to then do it again. So we're now recording. So everyone wave at the camera, please. Everyone wave. Can we do a big group, hello, mum? Hello, mum. That's actually from my mum. My mum. Um, OK, so uh, let's go back to up. There we go. And how do I get this to play? 
There we go. Right, um, just very quickly, um, just to tell you about myself. So I am a filmmaker that's been specialising in VR and 360 for the last five years. Um, I discovered it um, on the internet with um, a piece that was done by Immersive Media, uh, where they, they um, put one of their big Dodeca cameras, which was at the time a vastly expensive camera, in the middle of, I think it was Dallas Cowboys Stadium, as the stadium was collapsing. And so you got this kind of 360 view of this huge American football stadium collapsing around the camera, and it actually smacked into the camera, and I just thought this is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. We've got to tell stories with this, and that's going back six years. And I sort of dived through, stopped doing traditional and um, threw myself at 360. And I, I started the company um, in partnership with the Dutch company Yellowbird. Uh, and we commercially, we were sort of doing lots of advertising work over the last five years. And I was creative director of Yellowbird. So pretty much from the start, so from that immersive media explosion, and I should also give props to immersive media because they were the original um, uh, creators, that they created Google Street View. I've got to, go, I've got to give them <laughs> respect for that because Google always get the credit. It's actually uh, immersive media that, that did that. Um, they had, you know, experimenting with the cameras. There was a, a Canadian company called Point Grey that made very sort of kind of similar sized cameras, but they were, uh, it was fixed solid state six cameras called the Ladybug, which we've used for the last, and actually I still continue to use for live broadcast. Um, so there's just this been this progression, and it's interesting um, listening to Philip, um, you know, being very honest about how difficult these cameras are. They are a massive pain in the ass, and um, we are all, as the community, we are waiting for the day when I don't have to start six cameras, when I can just press a button and it records, and I know it's recording. And you know, we've got Samsung, we've got HTC, we've got Microsoft, we've got you know, Google and all these big companies. And I'm just like, as, a, as a, a filmmaker, I'm just praying that, you know, we just have a stable camera system soon. Um, yes, but it's interesting seeing how small it is. Can I um, just ask the room, has anyone, uh, has anyone here actually shot anything in 360? So hands up. That's loads. That's excellent. And is anyone, does anyone want to shoot in 360? Nice. Excellent. Good, 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 good. Right. So the, the point of me being here is to, to help you guys to, to do that. And I think the, the key message, really, that from all of us here as part of the community is that we desperately need filmmakers in this space. We need people to go out and experiment and make mistakes and start to tell stories because the more people are doing it, the better it's going to get and it's going to set the bar higher and higher and higher and higher. So typically, um, the VR producer or the director who is, is the, the key um, key person in the, in the team, someone who understands the process and has made the mistakes and gone down and, 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 uh, and experimented and played around with it and wants to tell stories. But, but beside them, you've got uh, designers and uh, the documentary team, so the DOPs and the sound guys, the guys who do, do the binaural um, sound design. We've got live streaming teams, so that's, tech, that's um, mixing camera departments with the technical teams uh, for uh, the web. Uh, then there's specialist editors. I mean, you've seen from the 3D stuff that Philip's been showing you. It is specialist. You do have to know what you're doing. Uh, CGI integration. Um, and then, of course, Unity. And actually, just in case anyone doesn't understand the difference, so a lot of my work is spent on traditional sort of broadcast uh, software. So I use Premiere and Final Cut and After Effects and we, we can produce a workflow. We, we produce excellent work, actually, with using those bits of software, which is, again, great to know. Um, with Unity, that's going down the, the, the games route. So uh, Philip kind of mentioned it with the fi file sizes. Um, the file sizes become huge uh, when, you, when you're delivering over, six minute, over five minutes, six minutes, towards 10 minutes. So, the, the dream scenario is that Unity, which is this games engine, can sort of still give you a sort of narrative story but kind of reduce the file sizes of the, the whole piece. So therefore, when you put the advert up saying, please download this amazing project, the people don't try and download two gigabytes because the majority of people, I don't know you guys, but have finding two gigabytes on your phone is quite hard. So you, know, you want to try and keep the file sizes down. And then finally, the app development team. So, Mobile and um, tablets, 
the guys that build the iOS, build the Android apps, that's also key as part of our business. So these are <laughs> an array of the wonderful cameras that we have. Um, the, this one here, this is the ladybug, that one there, uh, which I love. Um, it is, again, it's kind of tricky. It shoots 16 frames a second, but in post-production, you can up-res that. This baby here is from Samsung, so that's going to be launched soon. And the big, I think the one in the middle up there with 16 GoPros, that's Google's jump, as they call it. Um, and, oh yeah, sorry, I definitely want to recommend this one here. So this is made by, um, the, uh, he, was, he was the first one who did the GoPro rigs. Um, that's Freedom 360. So if you are interested in trying this, that's the one to try it. So it costs about, I think it's 400 quid. And then the cameras are about 400 pounds each. So, uh, and it's a good, you know, or you can buy the rig and then you can rent them in and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, cost wise, it do, it's not going to cost you a lot of money to get this kind of rig and get started and get testing and all that sort of stuff. And, and certainly there's a whole, if you go on forums, there's communities of people that will be, will have a whole lot of Go, GoPros and they'll share and they'll, uh, you know, they'll mix and um, they're happy. It's, it's a good community as far as sharing. Um, I'm just going to quickly. Because this is all about production, I'm just going to go over the same stitching thing. So it starts its life. The individual shots of the camera starts their life like this. And then each of those is then stitched together to produce the, the piece. And, and this is all the stuff that we've shot over the last, you know, so it's very commercial. So this was a job for, for Virgin. Um, but it's interesting seeing how it works. This bit of software I definitely recommend. It's by color. And this is we use to... Um, to stitch. You can see how you've got to adjust, you've got to manually adjust the, the horizon lines. You take the camera information, it does all the work for you, and you can see the way that the software is now working out where the different cameras are. So at the end of this, you know, when I'm looking at you waving at the camera, I'm going to be doing exactly the same as this. So I'm going to be your high mum, I'm going to be adjusting each of you, making sure the horizons are straight. Um, you know, and so You've, you can kind of see there's the barriers. I mean, yes, it's kind of a pain in the ass, but the barriers to actually getting this to a state, to a panoramic image that you can then put into a, 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 a VR goggles is actually quite simple. This shows you the, um, the scale that we do work to. So we typically, um, to get... Uh, to produce VR, you're producing two by one. And this shows you the scale of a 1920, 1080 uh, bit of HD in the middle. So we are working to a much larger bit of format. This was shot with the Ladybug at uh, 5,400 by 2,700. Um, and this kind of is just straight out of the camera. It's kind of a rubbish test because obviously it's projected in the day. You can't really see the colors and stuff like that. But you can get some really nice images straight out of these cameras and certainly, as far as the quality, certainly when you put, then are pulling this into um, the VR experience, you know, you can get some really crisp images, especially, really surprisingly, from the, uh, the GoPros as well. Uh, so how we treat the footage and, uh, and what we can do with the footage afterwards. This is um, a screen grab from a uh, project I did with, with Noel Fielding. And um, oh, sorry, I should with Noel Fielding with the Tate, <laughs> and uh, and um, and Channel Four uh, with Noel Fielding as our, our lovely um, presenter, taking us around the Damien Hirst exhibition. And so this was a web experience. This is a, a screen grab of our work off the um, uh, off the website, and you can see you can track, use the mouse, click around. But then you've got this sort of interactive um, tour. So I guess I'm actually just going to pause this. The reason I'm showing you this. I'm going to pause that. The reason I'm showing you this is it's, it's, you know, it's very easy to get distracted with VR. Like everyone's talking about VR, but actually the reality is maybe by Christmas there'll be a few more headsets available and people will get, go crazy. But really, you are delivering, as filmmakers, we're delivering to web and we're delivering to these. I mean, it's a good 80% of, of our audience are going to be viewing it on mobiles. So it's definitely worth, as filmmakers, to understand when you're talking to your clients, if you're pitching to broadcasters and you're you know, getting excited and they, they want to do, they want to make projects with you, definitely don't forget to mention the fact that it's all about you know, engagement and you want to get people excited. And certainly the web, 
is definitely um, the best way to do that. Now, within the context of the of, of web, you can then uh, let's see if I can skip forward. Yeah, you can then use rich media and hotspots. So this was an, uh, a, an example where, within the context of the 360, we had an interactive map, which then allowed people to then go to the different rooms and click and see the Damien Hurst experience. So, you know, this, this was a, a very um, important for us uh, experiment in engagement because the average time on this whole experience was 12 minutes. Uh, sorry, the average time. The total time of the content was 12 minutes, and the, the average time the users spent on this was 18 minutes. So they were spending another six minutes on top of the total content. And this was because of these rich media hotspots, because of the interaction, because of this wealth of, of, uh, of information that we were putting within the context. So obviously, on commercial terms, I was working at the time for a very commercially-led company, um, it was all it was fascinating. It was all about engagement. You know, people were really kind of using this content. And this was a, a live project we did with Top, Top Man uh, for London Fashion Week, where we then used the same technology, so hotspots within the, the context of the, of the piece. So I just wanted to show you this, just to remind you that it's not just VR that we're producing. We're producing it for a wide range of things. But anyway, I'm going to get back, back to topic. Uh, the future. So... I, you know, I'm quite scared of the idea of the human race kind of being in, you know, in its own little world and, you know, sort of putting headphones on, uh, sorry, the, the, the headsets on and then, you know, not really seeing anything. And I, th I think um, certainly um, mixed reality, so the ability to kind of have a headset that kind of you, know, you can see through is good, but also it's worth kind of noting the, this, this was started life as a BBC project, the Illumi Room, and then was picked up by Microsoft um, and this was this was actually this is this demo is probably two years old actually by now. But you can see kind of where this might go as far as as far as moving us back into the living room as filmmakers, getting uh, an audience that can actually enjoy this as a social environment. So you're sitting at home and you're watching your family, and let's say you're watching you know a program like Coast. You can you know you, as the programs. Um, as the program, program's on your TV, you can then turn around and look, and it's these, these two low-res projectors kind of work. And, you know, this is born very much from the gaming industry, but you can see sort of the relevance to where this could be going, could be taking us in the future as well. I, fi I find it very exciting. Um, I do love the headsets, though, but, um, but just certainly sort of moving forward, it'd be nice to, to, to have some, you know, th as many uses of this content as possible. Um, so CGI, um, CGI integration is, is possible. Again, you know, you, you have your computer models, you, you film, so you've got your camera in a locked off position. So we can, because the camera's not moving, we could fill this space. We could fill it with whatever we want because as, as long as the camera doesn't move, our 3D people can just build anything around. As soon as the camera starts moving, you can pixel track, you can have a, a computer, you can do it, but it just suddenly then elevates the budget. It's, it's quite difficult to do. So this concept was something that I pitched to NASCAR, uh, or Budweiser, and for a NASCAR project, where I love the idea of sort of ghosting out the car, the, um, the, uh, the driver, so the driver would just be like floating along the road, and then as you pressed a button, you know, the car would, you'd see the car building up around you, and, and um, you know, it's, it's those sort of uh, tricks that you can do, and certainly as far as engagement, are really interesting as well. So, and in VR, it looks fantastic because you're actually in the, in the, with the driver, and, and uh, it's really cool, really cool. Um, now, this video, I have to show you, even though it's kind of all about, I'm trying to make it, I'm trying to establish that anyone can do this. I, I, I can't not show you this. This was made by The Mill and um, released, I think, a week ago, showing a, a project they've been working with, uh, with Google uh, and a series of red cameras um, where they've taken it to the next level. So this is kind of Hollywood you know, so and this just really excites me. As someone who's been, you know, in the wilds and the, you know, making mistakes and tripping up and being frustrated by cameras, seeing these these cameras done in this big studio with a big budget and, you know, the mill throwing all their um, uh, special effects, uh, you know, um, magic into this just makes me really excited. And I think 
you know, yes, as documentary makers, it's, it, it, this might not be relevant, but it's certainly important to know that if we did want to elevate, if we did want to make something really, really stand out, really sort of um, play with that sort of green screen and, and, and um, you know, compositing ideas, then we can do it quite easily. Um, and uh, finally, I just want to bring it back to the audience. So Google are launching a big education thing with their, with their Google Cardboard. And I think it's important as filmmakers that we actually remember that it is the, the virtual reality is a delight. People absolutely love it. And for a six pound piece of cardboard with a cheap you know, uh, mobile phone, they can experience uh, virtual reality. So at the lowest point, this is a, a huge opportunity to reach millions of people and really inspire, take them into places that they've never been to and tell stories. And I think um, it's a very, very exciting time. And all I can say is please, please join us. We, we are, you know, we've been doing this, we've been sort of you know, trying to, to produce content and now the world is screaming for content, it's screaming for it. And it's time for you guys all, if you want to do it, just you know, get the camera, do the clap, put it into post-production and experiment. And, uh, yeah, it's really fun. It's really fun. So um, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, I've just got to check now that they... <laughs> I'm going to cut. Just check. No, we have to do it again. Right, everyone reset. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's it. So that was fantastic. Um, so I know uh, with the GoPro 4, it's got some advantages, but I've been hearing some problems of heating up. We've seen those problems ourselves of it heating up more than the threes. Mm. And, and I'm wondering what your experience has been. Have you found, like, would you say to this audience, or mostly doc filmmakers, it's okay to buy the older version? They'll have a great experience, and, and the fours may be great too, but they got some problems. So I'm seeing very specific to, uh, to yeah. this kind of audience that, you know, needs to know hands-on what would be best for them. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, this was, the, you know, this, so this is, this is shot with a ladybug um, at 16, 16 frames a second. Uh, and then the same piece was also shot from a different angle. So this is the GoPro uh, threes, I think we shot with the threes. These guys didn't overheat, so it was a two hour, actually no, we had an hour and a half break, and then they were, so they were, they were fine. We had one problem with the, the um, uh, I think one of the cameras miscommunicated. Big mistake I made was, for the live show, because once you've got the cameras in place, you can't say, okay, everyone, okay, opera, stop. You know, I've got a, I haven't, I've lost one of my cameras, so I think definitely having a, them wired in would be the best way, the safest way to do that. Um, as far as... Uh, I mean, rather than operate them wirelessly, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah in that situation. And also, I, I did a, a, a concert recently for... Um, just, just so people understand, this is your wireless on and off, right? This, yeah, yeah, And yeah, so, yeah, yeah. versus... Versus having it wired so you can turn it on and yeah, off. Yeah, so, so we, made it, we had a, an issue with, a, with a, a gig recently where I think it was just there was so much activity, wireless activity going on that our cameras just like flipped out. So, so I would definitely recommend, you know, certainly for gigs that you do, that you screw the, the wireless, just go, go straight to, to the, um, the um, yeah, manual, manual start. But of course, that means you then have to walk on stage and kind of check. And it's kind of, yeah, it's kind of, it's a, it's a, it is a pain. But the... Um, the plus side is you get amazing content and, and by, by really sort of pulling yourself into the heart of the action. I mean, you know, I showed the director of the Royal Opera House this uh, two days ago and he just literally, just, his face was just, he could not believe it, you know. I mean, he didn't actually even know that we were doing this. And, uh, and the fact that he was able to attend and see a performance of his, uh, uh, an opera at the Roundhouse that he'd never actually been to um, was just absolutely blew his mind. And I think certainly for the... Um, for the audiences as well. I mean, certainly this kind of stuff is just amazing. I mean, not to give away my age, but uh, the earliest films I worked on, we still had to change film in bags, right? It was not easy. Making films was not easy. Yeah. And so people now are like, well, what, why, why is it so hard? Well, guess what? It's a new medium, it's hard, but it's worth it because what you get is so mm. amazing. So this, this is a project actually, which is, um, we've, we've got at the, um, Site gallery. At the Doc Fest, yeah. The, the Grayson Perry taking us around his latest piece of art. Um, and this was, again, a wonderful example of, 
of documentary making, you know, you've got sort of, um, you know, Grayson just being incredible. And this, sorry, this is a sort of showreel of examples of stuff as well. If, you, if so, anyone, I should say, if anyone wants to actually see stuff, I've got um, headsets here, so if just come afterwards and I can sort of... And I've been hogging the question time, guys. Sorry, I think these are important points for you to understand. Questions, guys, before we have to go on to the next speaker. Any, anybody questions, questions, questions? We haven't heard from anybody before? Or go ahead, um, yeah, go ahead. Just a, just a quick one. Um, the, what I, I think we can capture the image really high quality, although I have a kind of question about actual film, and you brought it up. I'd love to see this shot on real film because I think that's got a much more immersive quality than digital ever can because it's by its nature. But um, for me, it's the viewing devices that I see that are the big problem. Hmm. Um, what's your opinion on that? I, I, I have no problem. I, I, you go to the pub and you, when people ask you what you do for a living, you whip out your mobile phone and you say, this is what I do. And for the next 10 minutes, you've got everyone in the pub going like that. The, 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 um, the VR goggles, I mean, I'm sure you must have done the same as well. You kind of take them into a bar and it's just, you are the most popular person ever. In fact, it's brilliant. See, you yeah, just, it's been, it's and, like, it's, and, and to give you an idea, right, two, 2000, January 2012 was not very long ago when I, I was, we had this huge duct tape goggles and now we have the Gear VR, right? Not very long in the chain. So goggles yeah. are not so hard anymore. They're getting easier and lighter. Stuff. And also the Samsung uh, 360 camera is meant to be able to auto-stitch it for you. So we'll see whether they pull that off. I'm so that means that that work is done before you even have to go to the editing. Yeah. So yes, people are trying to help make this easier. Any other questions before we? Yeah. One question here? Yes, okay, right here. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, oh, I'm so sorry. Okay. Thank uh, you. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a very basic question. Like, um, I want to know what you were mentioning before about the the crew and the requirements. And um, according to what is that you uh, plan a, a crew that you need for for this? Like, according to the the type of the, the what? According to the movement of the cameras? According to what type of elements do you decide uh, the type of crew you want? And one thing, this is like a kind of a composed question. Uh, second question inside that one. Um, one thing that worries me is the 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 fact that um, that how accessible is can be this technology for a region. For example, I'm, I'm from Panama. Uh, for these kind of regions, that uh, that there are stories that need to be told also and, and potential to be told in this way. Because um, I, I get approached a lot by people for the type of work I do, people that are kind of working with this new technology in Panama, but it's very, very, in a way that is very, very basic, nothing that I have seen here in the arcade. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing, the last question is, the, has there been any experiments on uh, working in senses, other like the smells and those kind of stuff? Hmm. Um, I, I haven't experimented with that. Ooh, exciting. Um, I haven't experimented with that sort of level of immersion. So, and, and certainly there are lots of companies that are trying different uh, techniques. Um, as far as your first question about um, how to show it, um, you know, it, I mean, it, check out on the internet. Google, I think they're really going quite strong on trying to get, you know, a $100 phone working. So their Android, um, you know, versions sort of rolling out cheaper versions. I mean, the, the Google cardboards themselves are six pounds each. And it, so it's the phone, but I think all the latest new phones, it's all going to be about VR, so it will definitely sort of lower the barriers. But obviously, you know, it depends. I mean, clearly, you know, you've still got to be affluent enough to, to afford a $100 phone, but, you know, I think it's going to come down and down and down in price. Um, uh, you know, so hopefully it'll be, you know, the more people that can see our work, the better. Um, Real question is Cuba. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, let's let, get this last question here, and we'll uh, we'll go on. Hi. Um, I wondered if you could um, address what's actually best to film, what sorts of places or subjects that you find with 360 or VR. Uh, obviously, there's the sorts of places that maybe people couldn't go to anyway. Yeah. But maybe what are the non-obvious places? Well, this this subjects? guy, this guy, the Oxman, was brilliant. We'd, we'd, we're making. I don't know. Like I, wor I worked in commercial. I was, it was all about you know the advertising dollar for, to begin with, and now it's kind of. I just want to make cool stuff, and, and this this is this guy was a, a great example of just like you know he's a, a um, 
a reggae DJ for, for Soho Radio, and we sort of followed him, you know, on his tour of Brixton, his uh, hometown, and he sort of takes us around. And it's just, no, he's just, he's just, he's just, awesome. it's just brilliant because you've got the VR goggles on and you're with him and you're taking, I mean, I would never go to that shop in Brixton and it's kind of, so you're asking about what the perfect scenario was. I think it was, the, uh, you know, the question came up earlier as well, the human experience, you know, having people, you know, close proximity around you, conversations. I mean, I, I think it would just be fascinating as a, as a news piece, as a, you know, conversations on the streets, you know, you, you can take that camera and put it anywhere and just you people just do not know what it is at all it's uh it's really interesting i'm doing i've actually been commissioned by youtube to to um to do a piece and we're it's going to be it's going to be a very it's going to be an interesting kind of uh next couple of years because uh, traditionally as filmmakers we're not allowed to shoot the public without i think there's a five second rule or what you know whatever uh, putting pub, For, sorry well, well, no, you know, the rules about, you know, filming, because obviously you put a 360 camera in, in, in the, a city and it, anyone walking past is in the shot. So, you know, do we ghost, or, you know, do we blur them out, out you know, like Google do? Or do, do we set a precedent? Is there some legal precedent saying this is just reality, you know? But, yeah. yeah. Sorry? Yeah, great, great. Well, there you go. Answer, well yeah, done. Yeah, there's, <laughs> lots, there's lots of reasons how and why. Yeah, there's lots of reasons how and why. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can... Go ahead. I just want to say, that's a big ethical discussion we need to have, you know, reacting to the subjects of this building. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, just, I, on I, the, I, just on the entertainment side, the busier, the more exciting it is, it, lo yeah. it looks more fantastic. It, it really it looks fantastic. Richard, that was amazing. Thank you. Oh, it was fantastic. You. Thank you very much. For <laughs> incredible, incredible lineup of speakers we have. Um, we want to also, if, you know, Brian Trolls, do you think you could just quickly come up and tell us about your VR workshop on Monday? So this is all whetting your appetite for learning more how you can make VR. Um, thank you. Yeah, why don't you come here so we can hear you, yeah. Great. I'll lend you my mic if that doesn't work. Right. Is that working? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you, Nani. Um, so uh, I'd like to plug, uh, I'm having a workshop on Monday morning at 11 at the Hubs. Um, it is a DIY, DIY VR workshop. So um, to speak to your point about um, making the medium more accessible uh, to, to different um, everybody, uh, I have a, a project called the Web VR Starter Kit, which is um, to enable uh, building VR uh, in a very basic way on, with basically next to no money. So if you have a $70 phone and a, a Google Cardboard, um, and a web browser, it's enough to build. So uh, if you'd like to come to that workshop, it's two hours long, so we'll go over kind of some of those concepts and we'll actually build a, a basic VR piece. Um, and if you have sort of any level of skills um, will be enough. So uh, please come check that out and let's build some stuff together. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, so um, next up is my dear friend Oscar Rabi, and I have to tell you how I met him before I yes. talk about right. who he is. So um, on my Twitter feed, I get this, you know, tweet at me, you know, uh, hey, your work is so amazing, can we, you know, whatever, you know, I'm, I'm getting really into doing immersive VR work, and, and so we kind of did this little tweet back and forth, and said, yeah, I'm coming to LA, and God knows why, but I just <laughs> said, hey, well, do you need a place to stay? And he wrote back, yes, and I was like, like, later on, I was like, oh my God, I don't know this guy, and he's yeah. coming to stay at my house, and what was I thinking? And, he, he showed up and it was getting late and I, and I forgot the key ingredient. I was going to cook dinner for him, of course. And, and I forgot the key ingredient, but I had my 13-year-old daughter. I didn't want to leave her alone and he was late and I couldn't cook the dinner. And who was this guy showing up at my door? And it turned out to be somebody who's become one of my best friends in life. Yay. So every once in a while, you, you, you just got to open up your door. So um, uh, Oscar's... Uh, oh, I'm screwing up my mic now, sorry. Um, uh, as an artist who uh, worked in many different kind of forms, uh, including some very interesting pieces like uh, the one that he did in Argentina where he invited a, uh, poets and painters to come and uh, have fight clubs to investigate mm -hmm. why people were attracted to violence, right? Very interesting. And then he made a very uh, uh, personal piece. I'll let him talk to you about that uh, in VR. And like me, finally found the medium that would scratch the itch to its, uh, let you create to your full potential. And um, uh, I'll let him finish up describing uh, why his work is so amazing and why then the festival commissioned him to build a piece that uh, even includes 
being able to see your own hands in the VR space as we try to figure out what does embodiment look like as well as feel like. So without further ado, uh, ado to, uh, Oscar Raby. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Oscar Raby. I'm a multimedia artist, um, originally from Chile. I now live in Melbourne, Australia. I moved there uh, just over five years ago. Um, I've been working since 2001 in different media. Originally, I started with multimedia design, computers and whatever you can do with computers. Started working with, with um, logo, I learned basic. I learned to speak English by using basic. Uh, my first computer was a Zinclair, which you might remember because it was quite popular here. Um, yeah, I studied art, I studied multimedia design after that. And uh, my practice started informed by painting. That was my main kind of mother tongue, if you may. But during 2001 to 2008, it went you know, sideways, in exploring what else I can, I can do that is not just painting, that is not just manipulating matter to convey some sort of meaning, story, or feeling. And you might, um, you might have seen it before, um, last year I was here presenting my work Ascent, a virtual reality documentary I made about my father. A very personal story that I'm going to touch on a bit later. We were actually having dinner with, with Brian last night and a few friends that work in the interactive media field. And uh, of course, opening night and lots of fun and, and, and people that you want to see. Uh, uh, you get into drinking wine and you get creative and then you get into the heated debate of uh, red wine. And as we were, you know, talking about the things we do, the things that we want to do, where we come from, where we're going to next, we got in this very heated fuel, uh, wine fuel debate about what nation had done uh, more for the world, <laughs> right? So it was either, you know, United States, the Netherlands, or Chile, right? <laughs> Um, so my friend from New York <laughs> so he said he couldn't remember the last Dutchman that had done something great after, oh. yeah, <laughs> after mm, mm, Rembrandt perhaps. <laughs> that was the line verbatim. <laughs> so that, that um, reminded me of, of what sort of journey I went through by moving from original painting, you know, as a, as a, as a original kind of uh, technique to, to go there where art is. As, as to what happened um, in, a, in a turning point, a pivoting point for, for the history of paint, for the history of art, for the history of paint as a technique in particular, which, is what, which was when, when we moved from just the sheer study of light as a representation of reality to seeing what sort of surface was in front of you, what sort of pigment and what sort of matter was ma being manipulated by the artist. So you re might remember um, work that, uh, from Caravaggio, for example, that worked deeply and, and, and with a strong focus on chiaroscuro, the, the interplay between light and darkness, and how that represented, how, was that, how that was used to represent reality, you know, the reality of uh, this dinner. Um, and one of those uh, great masters that did great work was Rembrandt. So around the year 1650, um, the Dutch masters, Rembrandt among them, uh, had taken craft, the craft of painting with oil paint to a very high level of skill and, and, and popularity. You know, they got commissions from, from aristocracy and, and from churches. Uh, and if they were commissioned, they would be able to sustain their practice. They would also become popular. And becoming popular, which is the, kind of the mainstream that VR is going through, would make them uh, establish a language. That language is the tradition of the study of light. How do we, would we manipulate this matter to you know, tell people about the night watch and what they represent, the icons and the symbols that are um, portrayed there? But other than the, um, the appealing glossy finishing that oil painting has, the oil paint as a matter, as a technique, 
And also the long manipulation time, you know, keeps, stays open and you can move it around and then you come a day later and you realize that the shadows are not right or there are a few fa happy accidents that you want to keep. You can play with that over time with oil paint. Uh, by the end of the 18th century, that was a key point in the history of, of, of the technique, painting with, with matter, right, with oil paint. Um, there was the arrival of oil paint. There was the popularity, sorry, the peak of oil paint in, in popularity. But by those days, by that time, you still needed uh, to have a chemical engineer as a friend that would prepare these this, you know, pigments and, and, and substances for you. Maybe not a friend, maybe you, have, you had the resources to uh, have the um, chemical engineer work for you and make those particular colors that you were after. That cerulean blue, that particular uh, lead white. But what happened at that time, right at the end of, of the peak of, of, of this study of light, someone came up with, with the cunning um, innovation called the paint tube. The paint tube was, was a small canister that could contain pre-made color. That pre-made color was standardized. You could have the same red consistently, or kind of mildly consistently, across the whole batch. And that would be distributed. So every single painter in every single town would receive the same color from the same company. Same specifications. And that would also would allow them to um, grab the paint tube and go out in the field. So they wouldn't have this contained set of circumstances that they had in their studios. I know that that light that comes from here, from through that window at 12 p.m. during the winter is going to give me this sort of halo and this sort of aura. There was a totally different landscape out there. They grabbed their paint tubes, whatever they can gather, and they walked out in the field. They developed the portable easel, their backpacks, set of colors, and a new way of painting um, arised. In doing so, we found different techniques. We found different ways of interpreting reality and capturing reality. It was no longer about uh, a representation of reality, as it is, a one-to-one -one mirror of reality, but perhaps finding that, that thing that was in front of your face, moving with you as you walked through the field, had to do with what you were going through. Your madness, perhaps, your, your desire for solitude in the field, your contact with, with, with those things that were stimulating your artistic creation. Van Gogh would be one of those uh, examples of how he grabbed these new tubes, went out in the field, and connected with whatever was going on around him. And, in terms, and instead of repeating the, the tradition, he would change it to fit what he was going through. To do that, you have to do it. I mean, to, to go through the, the, the thing of breaking off um, from a tradition, you have to go through it yourself. Uh, you have to, to you know, see what, what kind of makes, uh, what sort of changes it, it, it inflicts in your hand, in your gesture, in your understanding, in your thought process, when you are having time, when you're spending time with that matter, with those substances, with those techniques, with those sounds, with those you know, poses, different ways of, of conveying meaning and telling stories, whatever art you pick, whatever technique. But you, know, you have to do it. You have to go through it yourself. My dad uh, was an army officer, but he was also a Sunday painter. I learned to paint. I learned the world of painting. I didn't learn to paint, but I feel, felt familiar with paint because of the fumes, because of the colors, because of the, you know, the, the, the clothing full of stains, and, and, and particularly the smell. If you're in, in, in a painting studio, that smell is so beautiful, especially the... the, the it's like a barbecue, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, of colors. Did I just say that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I learned to paint vicariously by spending time in the same house that my dad uh, was. That informed my way of doing things. 
You know, if I wanted to do something, I would have to go through that process. I would have to put myself through the skin and the, and the, and the shoes and the frame of mind and as close as I could, I, I could go there, knowing that I would never be able to cross the skin boundary. But I would try to spend time with, with, with that thing that lived there as it was happening. So one of the, the, the pieces that I did... Um, Towards the last year, I had, a, I had a, um, a few years in Chile, just understanding my, my, my way of doing things. Uh, but when I found that, that I was ready to you know, move forward and, and, and break from the tradition that was established there, um, this is one of the latest pieces I, I did. And it was a, a, an open call inviting artists of any, any uh, silk, any, any, any type of technique, poets, musicians, painters, uh, actors, to get in the ring and perform a boxing fight, but not just performing it as in my minute, but actually fighting each other. It wasn't easy to convince people that, that it would be a cool thing to do, other than, you know, yeah, fight club. Um, so I had to put myself through it. And I'm going to show you uh, one of those fights. That guy entering the ring ring, make shift ring, used to be a very uh, good friend of mine, up until that day, right? And that one, this side is me, myself. So you'll see, uh, before the fight begins, that the, there's a canvas on the floor. Before entering the ring, from each corner, the contenders would, would soak the sole of the, the um, shoes with paint. So you would have one corner black, another corner red, and as we walked and, and, and danced around each other fighting, that would be a performative painting happening in the making. Just as an added element, I wasn't aware of what, what was going on, uh, but with the power of hindsight, it does make a lot of sense. But that guy helping me there, and who will be the referee of the fight, is my father whom I invited, because um, <laughs> being an, um, an army officer, being part of the dictatorship, <laughs> he knew a few things about violence, and I wanted him to be part of, of this event. So anyway, learning by doing. When I finished that, that sequence, and understanding that to do anything, I felt comfortable with the notion that to do anything, I would have to, to learn it by doing it, by actually putting myself in the position of, of, of whoever, I, who, whoever I wanted to you know, invite to the experience. I would have to be that user first. I would have to be that viewer. I would have to be that um, player first. But also, in the making, I, I realized that I invited my father, and my father was present. Through the, the, it was a constant thread through the fights. And, um, and I realized that perhaps it would be a good timing to do a piece about him. Because I was realizing that my father, being a part of, part of a military dictatorship, was actually quite an interesting character. And not just interesting, it was quite a difficult, complex character. So another piece that I made with him, about him, was this video. Over here. Yeah, pa. And you see that the end uh, has a lot to do with that. It's all in Spanish. I haven't subtitled it. It's quite old. You can tell by the grain. And on this video, we went to the. It's, it was a performance. It's documented as a video. It lives as a video art piece. But it was a performance for two. I invited him to go to the Atacama Desert, which you might. No, you might have heard that, that is the driest place on earth. And we set out to walk over 30 k's during the whole day, from one town to another town, which is the center, at the heart of, of how we arrived as a family uh, in Chile. My family coming from Birmingham, uh, they arrived there um, following the mining industry, and that happened in this desert. So my dad is telling me, um, look, the new way of teaching, because he was a military officer, 
he was part of the personal department. And uh, on that, he had to take care of you know, uh, the academic side of, side of things. So he's telling me how he has upgraded his knowledge as a teacher and what sort of teaching, what sort of what way of teaching is the one that the, the modern military uses. So it's not about giving you knowledge, it's not about giving you bits and pieces of knowledge, but making you go through the enactment of, the, of, those, of that knowledge. So if you want to make tables, you have to make a table. And as, yeah, he tells me about that, and suddenly he jumps onto revealing that he was part of a program uh, to, to protect the population from Marxist uh, ideologies. So they would, they would set out in the town, they would you know, spread in town, um, get in touch with people that were perhaps not having a good time. Kind of Scientology approach, right? So uh, getting into their personality flaws and seeing how they were doing and if they were uh, prone to embrace the Marxist ideology. They, he was told and he was taught along with many of other officers how to recognize the flaws of Marxism and how that would be a, a, a crucial crack in the, in the way that the army needed to be to eliminate the communist threat. Uh, threat. So when we, when we reached the town at the end of, a, of this trip, the whole day trip, we found this uh, drunk man sitting on the, on the curb. Um, well, I don't know why, but we sat down with him. And he was quite sad, flustered and sad and frustrated with his own life. So right after, after, after doing the, that piece in the desert, um, I moved to, come, came to, went to Australia, started my practice there, worked in, in a few galleries, and uh, decided to go back to, to multimedia design, to digital language as a main, main practice. And that's when I created Ascent, the virtual reality documentary about my father, who happened to be a military, an army officer, and part of the dictatorship in Chile. So what happened to him, and what is the, the core of uh, Ascent, is that in a day in October 1973, he witnessed the mass execution of 15 prisoners. Right in front of him, they, they got shot dead. There was nothing he could do. He was a witness to the event, but just being a witness entangled him forever. Up, up until these days, he has to go once a year to the police station and give his uh, account of the event verbatim, word by word. Anything changes, and who knows what could happen. Um, my father told me the, the um, description of, the, of that day when I was 16 years old. And that started a conversation that's been going for over 20 years. That conversation has changed from you know, being a sad uh, um, moment for, from, from him being full of rage and not being able to cope and understand why he, was, he had to go through that and be part of it. But he has been changing for over 20 years. To keep track with time, I'm going to skip the trailer, but I'm going to tell you uh, what was at the core of Ascent. It was a question. It was a deep, personal question. From seeing my dad, the painter, the Sunday painter dad, to being uh, this sort of dad, you know, this sort of character, soldiers kicking people on the ground and, and putting them in prison and, and, and hearing rumors that they were torturing, and that was my dad. That there is the same guy that was, that was painting on Sundays. I inherited that doubt, that hesitation. What, what is this thing that, that, that people are saying that you were part of, that I don't think you were part of? I mean, I, I don't really understand it. And I came up with this, 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 um, uh, this collateral memory, which is the, the, the understanding of I'm carrying something that is not mine but it, it appears to be mine. It appears to be, to be defining my personality. It appears to be defining uh, my own history. And I'm intimately entangled with it. 
So I um, re um, used virtual reality to put the user in that hesitation, right? I, I didn't have the certainty, all the cert certainty that I want to share this because I want to share my hesitation. I want to share that, that I cannot tell this is it. You know, this is my frame. I want you to look around as I'm wandering around trying to understand what is that thing. So as I was doing this, I uh, found myself developing these ideas of portraiture, which is, you know, from art, the art tradition of portraiture, has changed from, you know, King George V looks like that, or we, we accept that he looks like that, and it represents the kingdom, it represents, you know, the, the, the belonging to that uh, structure, to something that is more about process. How do we get entangled? How do we get uh, engaged in being part of something? which has little to do with how that thing looks like, but how you actually become part of it. Uh, the, the work in progress was called Eyewitness. You know, I wanted to, to tap onto that thing of, of uh, someone just by being present and, and, and not doing anything, not saying anything, you become part of it. Uh, I was working on the idea of, of the eyewitness and someone brought the Oculus Rift to the lab, to the studio, and a uh, story and medium it became in, uh, intim intimately uh, committed to each other. So yeah, I'm going to skip that for a case of time. Um, but I just wanted to mention that, just like you saw before, I have a couple, couple of pieces that have to do with that. One of them, for example, is a karaoke installation uh, in which you were inside a, a gallery space and you would you know, sing things that were written on the screen, while well, the background of the video, the video, the background of the, of the lyrics, would be explosions and destruction. You would still be having a good time and everyone would be cheerful without seeing what was going on. Because the thing was not, again, not the surface of the, 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 the visuality, not the icons in, in place, but the process that you were part of. And that's my statement, that in VR, um, Although we are inheriting a lot of, of language from filmmaking, it doesn't have to be like that. It can be more about process, which is what interactive media uh, is giving us, and we should take it. There is no, no, no camera in a 3D space. It's all, parametric, uh, it's, all, it's all a parametric mirror, right? It's like calculating the speed. It's calculating the way that the light bounces from something, uh, the way that two things collide, the way that um, you move in space. That's all parametric, so it doesn't have to be camera-based. And I would argue that that's what happened with painting back in the 1700s. And I want to leave it there so we can, we can keep going. Yeah? Thank you. People with a lot of deep thinking going into these pieces, right? People have got some interesting histories that they bring to bear. Uh, and uh, both excited by new tools, but also uh, clearly with Oscar, personal stories and also very aware of what these tools can afford and maybe also uh, uh, prevent from you from making, you know, hitting the notes you want to hit. Um, yeah. Oscar, I just want you to tell that story about what happened with the man that you met when you showed a scent here last Sheffield. Extraordinary story. Yes, um, last year. We showed, chef, uh, we showed a scent here. Uh, first day, probably the tenth person that, that puts the mask on. Um, older guy um, approaches the, 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 the computer, puts the mask on, doesn't say anything. I do the whole procedure telling them uh, this is a story about my father, documentary I made um, about this day that he, that he told me about. Puts the mask on, goes through it. 12, minute, 12 minutes later, takes the mask off, looks at me, and perfect Chilean, Spanish, Chilean accent, tells me I was friends with one of the, um, the victims. Tenth person, I wasn't ready. Like this, this was the biggest festival yet uh, last year that I was, had shown a scent. I had not, uh, had, not, had not prepared any reaction to that. Um, the next thing he does, is he holds me and he gives me a hug. 
You can imagine between the hug and his face telling me that he was friends with this victim, that was endless time. Because when you grow up in a place uh, like Chile, South America in general, or any, any kind of deep conflict place, places with deep conflicts like this, the uh, closest thing that you're expecting is a bit of hate. You don't know where that, that's going to come from, but it could be triggered by anything. And when he said that, I was prepared to get the whole tidal wave in front of me. And it didn't happen. So I can tell you that Ascent has helped me uh, a fair bit dealing with that, and I really hope that it could help other people in the same situation. Didn't he also say that the man that he knew was an artist, used to teach yeah, other well, artists in the town, and that as an artist he would be pleased that you'd end up using the work, using the, his death to make art. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. All right, open up for questions. Over here. Uh, yeah, um, for me, one of the big kind of questions, and uh, I'll have to give a definition first of all, but for me, one of the big questions is um, you know, this navigation within 3D space, or what, I, what you might call free willed navigation within three dimensional space, i.e., the audience being able to choose where they go. Now, it seems to me that one of the big advantages of working within a kind of constructed environment is that you can have that and you can control that to some degree. And it seems to me that one of the big challenges, as far as I can see so far, in, if you, let's say, the live action world, or which is you know, the documentary world that we're interested in, um, that's much more of a challenge. Sure, we can do tracking shots and, and, and the like, but it's much more of a challenge. So is there anything from the, the work you've been doing in that kind of constructed uh, three-dimensional space that we can draw from it that would be useful to us for the world of documentary, for the live action. Absolutely, and, and I, would, I would push forward right away saying that if, if we acknowledge that the talking head is the authority in the frame saying this is what it is or this is what happened, which is the outcome of putting this capturing device, namely the camera or the microphone, this is something that is happening. And while the, the light is red, it's captured. That's one way of doing things. Good. We have a long tradition of that. But there's another way, which is putting people through processes. So if you can go through the process and making the decision, go left, go right, decide to save, decide to, to kill, that could be the documentary of the process behind that, going through that. Yeah, yeah. Which, you know, it, we, we, uh, it's been challenging uh, because the mainstream of, the, of this thing that we're talking about is a database narrative, which is the least sexy thing that you can think of. Right? It's like, ah, all the options are in front of me. What, what do I do? What shall I do? Whereas uh, the work that we're creating now, I'm proposing more of a planning a party for someone, a dinner party, if you may, so you have your place and they have an order, and you can enjoy you know, the complexity of each one, but you, you go through them as the, uh, the world plans for you. Another Cheers. question? Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, one more in the back, and then we'll, we'll move on to the next piece. Amazing. Last but not least. Hi, Oscar. Hi, Mike. Um, can I ask you, <clears throat> it's a year ago since I first saw your first work, which you just described. Mm -hmm. um, and I've just been down to the site gallery and seen the exhibition of uh, all that VR work. Um, what have you learnt which is the most extraordinary thing in this short year? Wow, that, that, um, that you have to, to pick, pick sides. I mean, there are no conflicting sides, but you have to find what is that thing that you're doing. And when I found that, that working a, uh, around process was the thing to move forward, um, that is the key element to, to understand where you fit, you know, where you sit. When I, when I, when I produced Ascent, when I finished it, which happened to be like, that was my master's uh, degree final project. I just put, submitted to arts festivals and documentary festivals and film festivals, new media art festivals, to see you know, what was the fertile ground. And it so happens that documentary festivals were quite interested. And second to, in the list would be film festivals. So understanding how that, that you know, putting this piece out there and how it blossoms in different uh, fields was one of the key things but you know, it's investing time, and you know a lot about that. You know, investing time in seeing how it happens or doesn't happen, and not getting frustrated when it doesn't happen. Because in new media art, they didn't pick up at all. 
because it's going somewhere else. And I can say now that that, that else, that somewhere else, has to do with, with, with um, wet interfaces, you know, what happens with the body. So we're kind of almost there, but we're trailing behind new media. But we're way uh, beyond and, and, and at the front of the pack of the traditional film fields. Do you think that the, um, the narratives and technology that you've been experimenting with are a trajectory you'll follow on? Or do you think that you're in effectively you're learning um, your art and this is a stepping, a stepping stone in becoming an, an artist? You mean VR in particular? Yes. I don't think you've ever not been an artist. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it could, it could go anyway. I don't, I don't think it's, you can... I, I think that's what I was trying to show, that it's not a matter of technique. It's just keeping one thread, which is, you know, if, uh, if it's about enacting something, trying to do it in different techniques, in different me media. So I, 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 by saying that, I'm saying today I'm very, very deep into VR. We started a company called Vertov, you know, after Siga Vertov. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm not, uh, the minute that, that there is an interface that, that you know, it's in there that, uh, that challenges that, I'll be the first one going there. Yeah, right. Okay, so thank you, Oscar. That was fantastically thank interesting, you, as you. ever. Lots of stuff to digest there. Um, so um, we're getting close to those boxes. Thank you guys so much for not opening them underneath your seat for the special surprise. But um, coming up now, we're going to actually get a performance that I think um, it's sort of uh, the antidote to what uh, you've been experiencing. If you've kind of had enough with the VR space, let's try something that brings you back in here. And uh, Anagram is going to be doing their reality reality show. Uh, and hopefully, it's going to be some fun for us. So do you guys want to come up and there you are, <laughs> getting ready to go. I thought you were looking for you over there. Okay. Hey. Hi. So forget VR, forget out there. We're going to bring you back here. Yeah, that's great. You should take it. Hi, everyone. Uh, I do actually have a little bit of talking to do, um, but we'll get to the other bits very soon. Play. Okay, so my name's May, and I'm one half of Anagram, and the other half of Anagram isn't here today because she is in hospital, uh, and she had a car accident, so she's like, got lots of broken bones. So at the end, I just want you all to like, record a little message for her. That was just to Amy. And um, uh, back to reality. Uh, so Mark came up to us uh, at the end of South By and said can you do something that looks at virtual reality in a bit of a wonky way? And uh, we thought, okay, yeah, that's, that sounds nice. Uh, we could use this opportunity to celebrate something that we really like, which is reality. Um, so obviously there's a bit of a joke there because there's loads of reality everywhere all of the time, which is true. But maybe the question is, how can you get more out of it? So when people come out of VR, you know, the first few um, excitable conferences where people kind of took off the headsets and like the first, me the first kind of quote was, you know, that was so real. That, that felt real. So can you get the real feeling by starting with something that feels a bit more real? So... Before I let you loose on the crazy world of real things, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Anagram. So we make interactive experiences that are immersive. So everyone says that, right? So everybody means slightly different things when they say interactive and immersive. So I think, personally, for me, interactive means it's a two-way thing, which means that I have to ask my participant to give something of themselves. Um, and immersive uh, is, for me, about emotional immersion, about feeling like 100% there. Also, Amy talks much slower than me, so if I'm talking too fast, <laughs> can someone just say, slow down? Mark? 
Great. <laughs> okay, so um, the thing that we're most interested in doing is getting people to do things that make them feel things. So here are some pictures of things that um, has kind of helped us understand experiences, um, whether that's falling into a tree or sticking headphones up your nose. Now, that was very immersive. Um, basically, we think that the best way to choose what your interaction is is understanding what the experience is about so that there's a connection between what somebody has to do and what you think you want them to feel. And later I'll tell you what I think the best technology ever is. And then, briefly, some projects. Three. One. So I thought I'd mention this because Door into the Dark premiered in Sheffield last year, so maybe some of you uh, knew about it or went. Uh, it's an immersive documentary about being lost, and participants arrived alone, one at a time, were asked to take off their shoes, were blindfolded, and had to navigate a giant sensorial set um, while listening to stories about people who've been lost in different ways. So it was about combining physical experience and audio documentary and geolocative tech in there somewhere, which meant that, meant that where you were in the space, what you were doing, whether that was following a rope or um, assailing a cliff, you were listening to people whose stories connected with what your body was doing at the time. And we won an award, smiley face. And then uh, briefly, uh, like another project, which is R&D, and I mention this just because when you're thinking that the interaction needs to mirror what the story is about, it means that you end up making wildly different things in stupidly broad genres. Uh, so we're also working on the teleportation tent, name to be decided, which is um, for children to put together little, a den making kit effectively, which activates 360 visuals when they use objects from around the home which give them power over the worlds that they go to. And the key thing here is, is understanding like why would a kid build a den? And I mean, we can probably remember, I know there's no children here, but the reason you build a den is so you can have power over alternative realities. So there's something there about singing what the physical experience is and what it's about. And then another project we're working on at the moment is with the Tower of London, who asked us if we could create a nighttime experience that would make 25 to 30 somethings care about the Tower of London. So we're making a night game about treason and what it means to have dangerous ideas. So our jumping off point is the secret Jesuit societies of the 14th century. And you interact with the experience through a woven cloak um, with, interactive head, um, with interactive thread. So you have speakers in the hoods, uh, and then the three teams, the torturers, the spies, and the elite, move in different ways. And how they move depends on how your experience pans out. So, top line, every bit of the experience is part of the story. Okay, talking, talking, five minutes, it's five minutes, 25 minutes, 25 seconds, 28 seconds of talking. Um, so now you need to do something. So you're gonna do something, and then we're gonna talk about it again, <laughs> and then you're gonna do something else. So uh, does everybody have a box under their seat? So there's loads of boxes here because I thought that people would sit at the front. <laughs> Don't open it! <laughs> oh, it's Casper, hi. You know what's in the box. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> It's definitely saying something when you can get people excited about a cardboard box at a tech conference. <laughs> so 
So put your hands up if you don't have a box. You only need one. Somebody in the back hogging three. Okay, so um, you're going to have to stand up and take your box with you and find somewhere in the room, a new, a new place in the room where you can sit down. So I would recommend the floor, personally, and I would recommend taking your shoes off. It's a very airy church, wouldn't worry. You can feel the wind of reality through your toes if you take your socks off. No, definitely not. Huh? No, you don't need to look at the screen. You can face any, any direction. Doesn't matter if your feet smell, it's going to add to everyone else's sensual experience. <laughs> okay, you're about to engage with reality, and that's no small thing. I hope you're ready. Okay. Oh, interesting location. <laughs> Avant-garde positioning. Um, you're going to now open the box. There are two things in the box. Take out the top thing. Do not touch the bottom thing. <laughs> the black thing, not the white thing. You see, it's a, it's a metaphor about good and evil. We start with evil, we move into good. That's no, not. <laughs> okay, so the black thing is a blindfold. So can you put your blindfold on? Glasses off, probably best. <laughs> to see and not see at the same time, Mandy. So, <laughs> the dialectic of a blindfold. Okay. Sit still. You can take your blindfolds off now. If you like. I mean, <laughs> I don't think that my slides are particularly pretty. You could just keep them on. <laughs> Imagine slightly better designed slides. <laughs> um, so this particular slide is not that exciting at all. <laughs> um, so the reason that we did this is just to give you a little idea of what we're interested in doing, which is ways that you can engage people and immerse them. So as part of our method, this is a very small demo, um, we try to meet you where you are. We know where you are. You're in the middle of this crazy festival where there's 50 great things to do, and you're probably possibly from out of town, possibly have too much to do in one day, and here was a little moment of calm where you couldn't really see the program or your phone and you had an opportunity to reflect on being here. And then, having done that, we can take you somewhere else entirely by talking to you directly in a way which allows you to hear the story of a man who experienced something radically disorientating. I wonder, do you guys want to stay on the floor where you are? I can't remember if... Yeah? Just, just is everyone happy? That's great. Yes. I'm really into it. 
Um, anyway, so what we call this, um, our academic term, is the fluff. So the fluff is what you can do to somebody to make them hear your story more clearly, more viscerally. And I guess the question is, do you hear it more clearly because of what happened to you before that? And what is adequate fluffing? <laughs> it's a scientific term. So basically, fluffing is everything that happens to you, something that might be constructed that happens to you or might have occurred because of normal life. Um, that means that you can be open to a story. But why are we thinking about it so hard? Like, why does it really even matter? And that's a, sounds like a rhetorical question. <laughs> Partly, and the, my answer to my own question <laughs> is that normally when you're moving around the world, you're kind of in the slipstream of everyday life. You don't really need to reflect. It's pretty much autopilot. Um, and fundamentally, you're using your body. And when I said I'll tell you what my favorite technology is, it's, it's the human body. Because no matter what tech you're using, iPads, iPhones, Oculus, um, behind that, the technology you're counting on is the person who's going to be using that. And learning how to press the buttons, the squidgy ones, on the human body is um, something that you can't really take for granted. Um, so in order to kind of understand what that really means, we had to think a little bit about what are the experiences where it's really powerful when you press the buttons on the human body. So not dirty. But, you know, how can you get... Where, what are the experiences in life where the, there are small actions that relate to big impact? And it's kind of... It's this idea of ritual. Not necessarily sun worship, but the kind of everyday rituals of human life, the slipstream of doing something, meaning something to you that you don't even really reflect on it. So when you think about going to the cinema or going to the theatre, you know, there are all the little parts of that journey that you take at 6.30 p.m. to meet your friend at the theatre. You've just finished work. You've booked the tickets online. You can't quite remember where they are. You get there a bit late. You down a glass of wine too quickly. You go into the theater. The lights go down. You scramble your bag for your phone. You switch it off. And then you're ready. And all of that is part of where you are the moment that the story begins. And those experiences, those journeys, the cinema, the theater, not including the glass of wine and the phone, are like hundreds of years old and perfectly, perfectly polished to, kind of, to work. So when we're looking at kind of interactive experiences that don't really have names yet because nobody knows like, what we should call them, there's all the stuff that happens before that we need to think about, or that we, I like to think about. <laughs> So, um, here are the questions, the things that I think are helpful to think about um, when you're trying to think about the fluff that will mean that somebody is ready to hear the story, um, given, that, given that they're not sitting on a comfy chair eating popcorn. So I'm taking it for granted that you know about subject matters and that you can choose something that's good, so I'll skip that. So the fact that this work can happen anywhere is really brilliantly exciting. Um, and uh, it might be that you've only ever used Oculus at a conference, an industry conference or a festival, um, but that doesn't mean that's where it's going to end up. So what do you know about where your participant is the moment that they start using something which means that your story begins? What assumptions can you make about somebody who's leaving a cemetery or in the celebration aisle of a supermarket? If you're on the London Underground 
experiencing a story on your tablet, what happens if it's about having a conversation with a stranger? Does it resonate more? I think the answer is yes. I should stop using rhetorical questions when I know the answer. Okay. This is not the interactive bit, obviously. You're meant to listen. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that. The other thing is things <coughs> that are out there. I think you build us as lo-fi, Mark. I don't think we're lo-fi, <laughs> actually. <laughs> Incredibly technologically advanced. But lo-fi things are just things that have been around for a little bit longer than the other things, uh, because now you think an MP3 player is lo-fi. Well, no, maybe, maybe not yet. But the idea that you can have an association with an object. So some of you had slightly better velvet blindfolds than other people, but the idea of opening that and touching that blindfold is already part of an experience. Um, there's a quote that I like. It's always nice to put a quote in a presentation, I heard. <laughs> when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail. It's so good, isn't it? Because you really think, if you were to walk around a museum and instead of them giving you the audio guides, they gave you a hammer. <laughs> like you'd just feel differently about everything that you were listening to. <laughs> um, but if you're holding a iPad, like what does everything look like? Can, can we hide the tech into something that's more exciting or already start somebody on the journey that you want them to go on? Um, and the other thing is the body and what is your body doing? Because you no longer need to be sitting down on the comfy seat in the cinema, you can be moving around. What happens if you're listening to a story about forgiveness while you're kneeling on the ground, or you're holding somebody's hand while you're listening to something about connectivity? Um, something I really liked about Ascent <laughs> was, uh, like, it's one of my favorite VR experiences, and I feel like it really resonates with me, partly because it's about bearing witness and not being able to act or intervene. Um, and that's partly because it's the limitation of where you are. Um, yes. So we're going to play a bit now, again. So we've had a little experience. I have to explain to you what I think about it. Um, so uh, we're going to have some ideas together. And ideas are quite intimidating to have. So we're going to use serendipity to make the ideas better. So Vicky is my assistant. There are four colored post-it notes. You're gonna need a pen, uh, so just pass it around at random. So how's it gonna work? You guys sitting like this is problematic. <laughs> Pencils. I'm going to be finished in about five minutes. That's perfect. Is it? Yeah, because no, then Nonny will wrap up, then Mark will wrap up, and then we can move in. Okay, yeah, well, do you want to hold it? Great. So low fi This is so uncool. <laughs> cool. Here I have my high tech piece of paper. <laughs> Okay, does, um, does roughly everybody have a post-it note of various colors? Yes. You can have two if you like. Um, so, on your post-it note, depending on your color, so listen to what each color is, 
If you have an orange, no, let's start with yellow. If you have a yellow post-it note, on it I'd like you to write a theme for this experience. So by theme, I mean subject, uh, love, forgiveness, like universe, good, good, like heart-clenching things that we're all obsessed with, death, money, uh, fame, something like that. That's for the yellow post-it notes. On the pink post-it notes, I'd like you to think of a location where this is going to happen. Some place resonant, um, weird, cool, conventional, unconventional. That's the pink post-it notes. Pink location. Orange. There's an object in this experience. It's a thing. It's an evocative, powerful thing. It means something. What is it? Choose a good object. Oh, there is a light green and a yellow. They're not the same, by the way. I don't know if you can tell. The light green is your action, what people, how people are going to move, what they're going to do. Are they going to dance? Are they going to dig? Um, run? Crawl? They can, I mean, they don't need to do it alone. It could be something, you'd, you know, maybe it's tango, so they have to do it in pairs. Or maybe it's group therapy, and they have to do it in group. But that's, you know, only if it involves the body. So, it's, and then, I just thought it'd be fun if you all just stick it on the board randomly and see what happens. We can make some good things later. <laughs> so, come up when you've written your word and stick it randomly. You won't be at fault if, the entire thing doesn't make huge amounts of sense. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so all the yellows in a row like this. Yeah. Great. So I guess actually it would be good if they all kind of make columns. Do you want to just put them here and I'll... I mean, they could actually all be here. Your mom's shoes. No, no, let's put them in the right place as objects, right? Ecstasy. Is that a theme or an action? theme. And location, garage roof. Yeah, that's an accident. I got a going? few more, but I thought I should do it. No, 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 don't. Look, we, it'd be great you can get to the end. It's made it unfair. <laughs> <laughs> what have you got? Oh, nice. Oh, that's a good one. No, this is a really good <laughs> way of like, generating <laughs> future ideas. Yeah, that's why I thought. Frisbee, go. Lots of guns. So do you want to volunteer reading them out? Yeah. Should I read them out? Is that kind of my job, to read them out now? I think so. <laughs> okay. I have. So let's just make that.
ship. So it's a shame that we've got so many pink ones. Oh well. Okay, everyone. I'm gonna. To, we're almost done now. Hello. How's that? Do I want to talk to the top or the bottom? Hello. Last sword. Okay. Uh, okay, so just to prove how exciting a bunch of people you are, to end this, I'm going to give you uh, some of these projects which have been developed right now. Okay, so an experience about youth set on a hilltop using a fishing rod where people have to sing a cappella. <laughs> Pretty good. An experience about the birth of a child set in a Uluru, the Australian outback, <laughs> using a rag where people have to give back rubs. <laughs> Serendipity. <laughs> An experience about the power of the violent power of awkwardness set in a coffin using a gun where people have to scratch each other's ears. <laughs> the experience, an experience about isolation set in a, set under the bed, that's what it says, using another gun <laughs> where people have to touch noses. Okay, uh, I'll read out another couple and then I'll just leave it here for people to have a look at. Uh, an experience about spiritual revolution set in the bath using the river where people have to jump. An experience about getting old set in heaven using a dildo where people have to dance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks very much. <laughs> Brilliant, thank you so much. Um, it's also really amazing to ask the question about how to get people in the right space before VR, because I've found, from, as a VR producer, it, you, sometimes you put people in a really odd spot, and the, the, you know, 20% of the people that you put the VR goggles on are actually feel awkward. You can see their body language, you can feel that they're self-conscious. So I just wanted to say it's brilliant for you to open that up as a way to sort of how to relax them, how to make people, um, you know, I don't know what the answer is, but it's just excellent to be thinking about it, so thank you. Great. Questions? Questions? So, um, just how about this, any thoughts about taking what she's kind of shown you to, uh, back into your own practice? Anybody have had any inspiration? I any do have a fantasy show? about hiding a VR headset in a giant fish head as part of, or something more friendly. <laughs> but something about kind of disguising the black plastic, um, I feel, would be kind of part of that, like, invitation to play as opposed to, now you're going to see something that you have, that's so incredible, which is a difficult place to be in. You're like, well, what am I going to do? Aha, some questions. Good. Thank you. It's more of a comment, but um, often when I've made 360 degree interactive videos and I present it to uh, members of the public, only people who are native to touch screens and that sort of thing really understand it. 
And um, I guess my question to you is, how do you invo involve people who perhaps aren't so familiar with these sort of technologies mm -hmm. regarding VR and 360 degree videos? Um, it's interesting, that thing about, I don't know what to, because when you put people in position where they feel like they don't know what to do, um, everybody hates to feel stupid, and it's the opposite of engaging. Uh, so that sense of like, what's an intuitive way of asking someone to engage? I mean, everybody knows if you walk into a room and there's a red telephone and it's ringing, you instinctively know that you, you're, it's a call to be answered. Or, you know, you don't even need to give instructions in that sense. So I don't know, maybe have a red telephone ringing in your video. <laughs> but um, that sense of, um, I guess that's kind of why I like using physical objects rather than screens, uh, partly because we're more familiar with physical objects than touching things, like touching things. And it, there seems to be like, well, why should that? Why should that happen? Now it just becomes about technology and what technology can do as opposed to what this thing is about. Did that answer the question? Just uh, the issue of natives is a really interesting one. I mean, the story I was talking about my son and my daughter being, my son, my daughter being in a garage office and my son being in the living room and my uh, daughter walks in the living room and my son said, you know, why, do you, why did you leave? She just walked in the room. But what he meant was, why did you leave the Minecraft server they were playing on together, right? So shared space, it's going to be very interesting. And I think you really, really have touched on a lot of these how to create these very interesting shared spaces um, uh, without sharing them, right? It's all sharing it internal versus necessarily sharing it externally. Um, and there's something maybe that connects those two ideas. Um, so, do, I, you know, obviously the work you're doing um, could lend itself to some virtual experience. Do you think you'll apply? Definitely, yeah, but I think it's, in a way you kind of want it to, it's exactly that question that you just don't want there to be a lot of instructions on the box. Um, uh, because if you're immersed, then as soon as you have to think, oh, what am I meant to do now? You've come out of the little bubble. So until I kind of think, you know, the technology serves the experience and not vice versa. But yes, not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the Del back there, please. I, I haven't seen Door, is it Door to the Dark? Door into the Dark. Door into the Dark. But I was really interested, um, especially while we're blindfolded, um, that listening to that, um, the blind person speaking about his experience of the world was really amazing. And I'm just wondering about, you know, how, you know, say blind and vision impaired people have influenced your, you know, your, your thinking and your work. And obviously we've seen that today with the blindfolds. Mm -hmm. But, you know, how, how people with other abilities have influenced you and how you might create work for those people as well. Mm. I think, you know, there's, there's often somebody who asks you know, has a blind person experienced Door into the Dark and what did they feel? Um, several people who, are, who had parents who were blind or siblings were very moved by it because they said, you know, I've always been trying to imagine what it was like for them and I never have until this. Um, and in a way, partly because that is, that's actually the objective to to feel someone else's experience, um, which isn't your own. Not saying that all blind people have the same experience. I mean, the way that John Hull described the rain and his skin isn't necessarily going to be how people who are blind experience the rain. And there might be resonance there, and it might not really feel... It might also feel like someone else's experience. But I, I, I've, I kind of feel like that's not necessarily the the point of the, of the work, in a way, partly because where we started was the idea of being lost. We didn't start with the idea of being blind. We started with, can you make an experience about what it means to be lost, where you reflect on how hard it is to cross into the unknown, but are also invited to do that at the same time. So you feel that trepidation, excitement, transformation, 
as you hear about how it happens to other people. And then it became a matter of like, so whose story, whose story allows somebody to trust? You know, who can, who can tell that best? And John Hull had written a book called Touching the Rock, which is his experiences of losing sight, which I'd read, and I thought, well, he'd be, he should be one of the characters in, the, in it. We'll take one more question, and then I think we better wrap up. Right next door there. You got it, great. I got the thing. Okay, it was, a, it was an observation, really. Um, earlier today, I had the pleasure of uh, taking part in Clouds Over Sidra, which is one of the VR pieces in the site gallery. And I had this really strong experience of feeling that I actually felt more vulnerable within the VR environment than actually my physical presence in the room of the site gallery. Um, I wasn't sure whether I was meant to be standing in front of all those people in a refugee camp and whether I was imposing myself. But of course, it's a recording. Um, and it got me thinking about, A, I'm in a safe space in a church amongst like-minded people and, I hope, friends. Or I'm in an art gallery, which is another safe space for uh, observing other things. And then I remembered that a week or two ago, I was walking through a pretty rough estate in North Liverpool, where I live in Liverpool, um, listening to a sort of psychogeographic audio piece made by some people who live there, and that it tested my boundaries a lot more. So there's this thing about context and vulnerability. So that, of course, when you're wearing a headset in a fixed space or in a safe space, you don't have to think about your physical body. So when you take it outside into a very different domain, um, suddenly it's a, it's a real impediment. Um, that was just what I'm thinking. Well, on that note, it's sort of amazing that what you did was inspire people to get internal and observe and feel. Mm -hmm. And so congratulations. I think that was really well done. So I have to say uh, all of us should give her a huge round of applause for making us all get an opportunity to be here. Thank you. So thank you, amazing day. Right. And I'm going to turn it over to the great, the great Mr. Atkin to wrap up for the night. Thank you very much, Nani. I just want to say thanks for moderating this afternoon. It's been fantastic. Uh, thanks to all of the speakers. Yeah. Um, thanks to Smiz for capturing these talks. We will uh, photograph them and stick them online as, and start tweeting them. And we'll make sure that we hand them over to the people who... Uh, who made the talk so they can tweet them as well and everything. So we'll start trying to spread those. Um, almost all of the people who created any of the work in the, um, in the Millennium Gallery and in the Site Gallery are kind of popping up at advertised times next to those pieces to talk to people around them. And those times are advertised on the website uh, and in the app. So if you want to discover more and talk to them in greater detail, you'll be able to do, do so in the gallery space alongside those um, artworks at the Meet the Maker slot. Um, we have created our own kind of customized cardboards. They're not Google cardboards. They're actually a little bit better, but they sell for the same price, six pounds. <laughs> they're called visors. Um, and we're selling them on the merchandising stand. I think we've probably got some here, maybe, as well. Yeah, I mean, there's a stall outside if you want to buy them. And, um, and then you can download um, from the Verse uh, VRSE um, uh, app store, Clouds Over Cedra, and just watch it directly on that on your phone. And you can also look at uh, Thomas Warner's um, Arctic 360. Um, right, okay. And we're, we're going to put a list together of, of things and stick them on our website of anything that you'll be able to watch on, that, uh, on those viewers. So if you give us all those details where you can download them, it would be great. Um, I'd like to thank Tom Millen very much, who helped me put all of this together. <laughs> and Mark Riddington, who's um, helped us run the show today. Um, the tech guys over here, thank you very much. And our marvellous volunteers. Thanks, everybody.